Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching, yes, the Yankees Entertainment and Sports Network. Well, they came and got me out of Texas. And uh, I can tell you, it's a privilege to be back. I'll be talking to y'all soon. Today, Roger Clemens arrives at the stadium, about to begin his second tour of duty with the New York Yankees. And Clemens' return, it is a hot ticket here in New York, as those eyes will be back on the mound at the stadium in moments. And today, the Yes Network presents New York Yankees baseball. Today, it's the Pittsburgh Pirates against the New York Yankees in the middle game of a three-game set from Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Yankees baseball, along with Bobby Mercer and Al Leiter. I'm Michael Kay. The Yankees have won four in a row, but that's the sidebar. The main event is that Roger Clemens is back in pinstripes. Now, the two gentlemen that flanked me here, they started their career with the Yankees, and they came back and ended their career with the Yankees. Bobby, how emotional was it for you? Well, it was very emotional for me because I never thought I was going to get a chance to come back to the New York Yankees after I got traded to San Francisco. I mean, when you think about playing for the greatest sports franchise in the world with 26 World Championships, it's very emotional because this is where I started, and I grew up, and I had to leave for a little while, but I was had the opportunity to come back. It was very emotional for me. I think it definitely will be emotional for Roger Clemens, too, because it's the kind of stage that, that he thrived with. Now, Al, you started your career with the Yankees. You really made your mark with other teams, though, and you finished it with the Yankees. When you did come back, was it emotional? Well, to further what Bobby was saying, there, there's no better city to play in. There's no better city electric-wise, the fans, and this stadium in Yankee Stadium. And Roger feels it like any other player's ever played here. And uh, I certainly felt it. In 2005, when I came back, I was doing terribly with the Marlins, and it was a great moment for me to, uh, to pitch well for the Yankees and uh, help them in 2005. Well, I think we know one half of the pitching matchup. Let's take a look at the entire pitching matchup brought to you by the New York Lottery. The guy who's going to be the other guy on the mound is Paul Mahalam for the uh, Pirates, 13-19 and 19 with a 4.54. And you look at Roger Clemens' lifetime mark, 348 wins, 178 losses, a sparkling 3.10 ERA. Clemens has had uh, many great moments as a Yankee. Won two world championships and a Cy Young year. When we come back to lineups and Roger's first pitch, that's next on Yes. Roger Clemens takes the mound here at Yankee Stadium and the crowd giving him a loud ovation. So Clemens stayed in the uh, clubhouse during the national anthem. Once the national anthem was over, jogged up the clubhouse runway and then up the steps and out to the mound at Yankee Stadium for the first time as a Yankee after three years spent with the Houston Astros. So it should be an exciting day here at the stadium. Obviously, the Yankees have been waiting a while for this. On May 6th of this year, he announced from the owner's box here at Yankee Stadium that he was, in fact, coming back. And that started about a month of uh, getting ready. He pitched at A-ball, double-A, and most recently at Scranton and Wilkes-Barre, uh, triple-A. And the governor of Puerto Rico, Anibal Acevedo Villa, will throw out the first pitch. And Clemens will have a little more velocity, but he hopes to have that kind of control. So we're almost ready for baseball here at the stadium. So Roger's got the game face on. A little 5 o'clock shadow working, and uh, he is ready. And Jorge Posada signing an autograph for the governor. Jorge lives part of the time in Puerto Rico during the winter. And the governor departs toward the Yankee dugout, and we are ready for Roger Clemens' rocket relaunch here at the stadium. Let's take a look at the Pirates' starting lineup that Roger's going to face, and it is presented by Rico. Jose Bautista, the third baseman, leads off. 
Freddy Sanchez at second will bat second. Batting third and playing left field, Jason Bay does not have great numbers lifetime against Clemens. Adam LaRoche, who's really been struggling against everybody lately, he'll be at first base. He'll clean up. Batting fifth and DHing, nursing a bad hamstring. Xavier Nady, Ryan Domit, the right fielder, will bat sixth. Batting seventh and catching, Ronnie Paulino. Jack Wilson, the shortstop, hits eighth. And Chris Duffy is in center field, batting ninth. And let's take a look at the 24 year major league pitcher there you see 2006 Roger Clemens with the Houston Astros a season shortened by his late signing 113 innings he's been uh, nearly perfect down there in Houston and pitched very well for them and here back at New York with the Yankees and let's take a look at the Land Rover pitcher scatter court control adrenaline on. he's got 348 wins 24 years experience this is some special place it's meant a lot to him and we'll see how he does control his adrenaline leg it out in his last start while pitching in AAA for the Yankees AAA farm team, he had a groin strain in his right groin, so we'll watch for that. He uses his lower half tremendously. At 60-40, after his 40th birthday in 2002 on August 4th, he's got 60 wins in leadership. You know, he's a guy that's really going to, uh, I think, extend that leadership kind of mentality and, and, and impart his knowledge amongst the whole group in that clubhouse. And you see the captain, Derek Jeter, sharing a laugh there with Roger Clemens, so we are ready for baseball. We'll have to find out later what Jeter said that elicited a laugh from both of them. So Bautista is ready, and so is Clemens, and the Rocket delivers. And a bunt the other way, and you kind of figure that the Pirates are going to bunt to test out that fatigue groin that he's been dealing with. Well, the Pirates have been looking for a leadoff hitter for a long, long time. A lot of guys uh, auditioning for uh, Tracy. And today, uh, like yesterday, it's going to be Bautista. So if you're a leadoff hitter, I think you've got to be able to do a lot of different things uh, to try to get an offense going. Uh, the main thing for a leadoff guy is to get on. And the 1-1 from Clemens. Outside 2-1. and one. So Clemens, 44 years old, will be 45 in August. Has spent the three previous seasons with the Astros compiling a 2.40 ERA in that time. And Bautista pops it up. Phelps near the seats, and he'll run out of room. The 2.40 ERA over the past three seasons is the best in baseball. But Roger did not win as many games as many people thought that he should win. And you see his numbers with the Rockets, or with the Astros. Because the Astros averaged just 3.6 runs per start for him. And that was the worst of any pitcher over that time. Just no offensive support at all. He's hoping to get better support with the Yankees. Well, I think the offense is, uh, is better than the Houston Astros offense here in New York. And he, he definitely will benefit from that. If he gives the same numbers that he gave in Houston here in New York, uh, he's going to win a lot of games. And the 2-2. Driven to deep left field. That is going to be trouble, and that ball is off the wall. Oh, wow. no, it's a foul ball. It is a foul ball. Matsui slipped, and it was just foul. The third base umpire, Paul Nauert, right there. Well, Matista got out in front of that, uh, looked like a fastball, and it was curving, and just mm. curved foul at the last second. There's not a whole lot of, well, that's a split finger, not a fastball. Split fingered fastball is what they call it. And it was diving down and in, and Batista got the bat out there, and luckily a curve foul. And the 2 2. Missed outside, 3 and 2. Clemens in third place on the all time strikeout list, one behind Randy Johnson. After coming with that split finger inside, he tried to paint away. You see there, he missed a little bit outside. 3-2. And that's a base hit through the right side for Bautista. Now, we talked about this on the pregame show. Roger Clemens has seen it all. He's won seven Cy Youngs. This is a straight fastball by Clemens. 348 wins. Pitch was up and away. Took it that way. He's 44 years old. Al, do you think there's any butterflies involved right now with Clemens? I, I would think so. I, I think espe especially first inning for any, any pitcher, but as you just described with his resume, you would think he would be calm and cool, but 
This is a big moment, even for Roger Clemens and all of the awards that he's won in his past. You want to do well. Pitts to Sanchez is inside 1-0. Well, well, he knows that uh, everybody in the world is watching this performance right now, and, and we'll hear about it uh, through the papers and, and all the media and print and television. I mean, it's going to be Roger's uh, return, and you see what his career resume is, and that's uh, allowed him to return at the age of 44. Besides the fact that Roger Clemens has a tremendous workout program that has allowed him to compete at this level at his age. And the 1 0. High fly ball center field. Melky Cabrera step in now back. And there's one away. Been a natural progression, and uh, he started uh, in in A ball. He went to Double A and to Triple A, and now uh, on the regular days that he's supposed to be pitching, he's here pitching in the major league level. So uh, the plan that they had uh, put out for Roger and Roger's plan himself has has gotten him here uh, without too many problems, other than that uh, little weak groin that he has on the right side. Pitch outside the bay. And I'm sure that uh, Gidry and, and Joe Torrey, is, uh, they probably discussed the day before the game that they're going to leave it up to Roger. I mean, Roger is in control of himself, and and uh, if he says that uh, he's had enough or, or, or if he's uh, fatigued a little bit or the grind uh, feels a little bit sore, uh, it's going to be up to Roger to, uh, to explain that to them. And one of the things that a pitcher a pitching coach and a manager does with their pitchers that you have to have a lot of confidence in them to tell you the truth. If they ask you something, and Roger's one of those guys, he will tell you the truth. Hits the bay, swung on this. Talk about Bay's uh, bad numbers uh, career wise versus Roger. I think one of the reasons is that Roger exploits uh, the strike zone with Jason Bay because he's such a free swinger. I'd be surprised if uh, the Rocket gives Jason Bay uh, too much to hit. He's the one guy in this lineup that you want to not let beat you. Count one and two. Well, the previous pitch was supposed to be a fastball away. You see there, Roger hitting his spot, driving the ball through the zone and staying away. On a very good hitter, Jason Bay. And the one two and that gets away from Posada allowing Bautista to move the second. You now with Roger Clemens there's been very little concession to age. There's a splitter that bounced in front of Posada. He's still a power pitcher and he's taken a lot of pride in that and now as somebody who came up as a power pitcher is it hard to believe at 44 that he could still sport that sort of stuff. No question about it. With the fact that he's won 60 games after 40 still throwing the ball in the low to mid 90s. It's pretty remarkable. Swing and a miss and Bay down on strike. So that ties Randy Johnson for number two on the all time list. And that'll be a back and forth thing all year. Came back with a split finger. That ball out of the hand of Roger Clemens looks like a fastball. And at the end you see it just dip just slightly. First base. Jason Bay. He's batted 162 against right handed pitchers who throw a changeup, and that split finger is very similar to a changeup. Roger Clemens idle, Nolan Ryan leads with 57 14. And Clemens and the unit both at 46 05. Here's Adam LaRoche. Line drive to center field. It is a base hit. Charging is Monkey Cabrera. Rounding third is Bautista. Here's the throw. It's cut off by Phelps. An RBI single for LaRoche, and the Pirates lead 1 0. Well, Melky with a good arm in center field, uh, it was just too much. Uh, with Batista getting a good jump and lead off at second base, and uh, Melky charging very well, but the throw is off line, and Phelps has to cut it off. Here's Xavier Nady. This will be the 17th pitch of the inning for Clemens, and. He is not on a pitch count, but they will start to watch him closely at 90 pitches. 
there's a strike. Well, you were talking about his average innings last year with the Astros, 5.9 innings. Uh, he also averaged uh, 95 pitches. Never, never went past 115 pitches for the for the Astros last year, and never pitched beyond the seventh inning. And that's what you get with Clemens. You're hoping that you get six solid innings out of him, and then a lot of responsibility for Clemens Stark is going to go to the bullpen. You're going to have to get three innings out of the bullpen. Well, the Rockets' whole philosophy uh, when he was here uh, with the Yankees the first time was, uh, I'm going to go as hard as I can for as long as I can. I'm not. Uh, I'm not pacing myself. I'm not looking to pace myself. I'm just going to go as hard and as long as I can. And the one one upstairs. Well, I think part of that numbers is pitch counts and innings. When you're with a, when you're pitching for a team that's having a tough time scoring as the Astros did for him. Every situation that's a scoring situation you, know, you pitch a little more carefully in the sense that you don't want to throw a pitch that is very hittable if it is a base hit double or a run score that you see that as not just a run you see it as a potential loss. And in doing so your pitch count gets up and just as you described it you're, you're not getting as deep into the game but Roger at this stage of his career there's no question you go hard right from the first pitch until you empty the tank. The 2 2 he struck him out and he moves ahead of Randy Johnson all alone in second place but he does give up a run in his first inning back with the Yankees one run two hits no errors and one man left two strikeouts as well it's the Pirates one and the New York Yankees coming to bat here on yes. Well we go to the bottom of the first inning and Joe Torrey was asked before the game what exactly Roger Clemens brings to the whole party other than pitching. Roger just his enthusiasm alone uh, certainly makes you feel good. And, you know whatever the result is you know here's a guy 44 years old uh, you know here for the second time and it's like this game is brand new for him and to me that's that's pretty special. Well this game actually is brand new it's the bottom of the first inning the Pirates scored a run on the first against Clemens and now the Yankees will take their chances against Paul, young Paul Mahalam. We'll give you the Yankee lineup in just a moment Johnny Damon leads off. And there's the strike. <laughs> 13 start for Mahalam 5.35 ERA more than a hit per inning. And that one is served in the left field, the base hit for Johnny Damon. Let's take a look at the entire Yankee starting lineup presented by Rico. You know that Johnny Damon is a DH. He's leading off the captain, the shortstop, Derek Jeter, bat second. Red hot, Bobby Abreu is in right field. An eight game hitting streak for Abreu. Alex Rodriguez at third, cleans up. Posada will catch. Matsui plays left, batting seventh and playing second. Cano, Josh Phelps back at first, bats eighth. Batting ninth and playing center field is Melky Cabrera. So Gorzolani yesterday did a good job, young left hander, and now Mahalam trying to shut down the Yankees, but Damon leads off with a single. And there is the strike. Mahalam, uh, a kid that uh, induces a lot of ground balls. I mean, he's a sinker ball pitcher, and he's got to be pretty perfect. Uh, he's not overpowering like Gorzolani uh, can be with his fastball and utilizing the curveball. And but uh, his biggest pitch is uh, is the ground ball, sinker down, like that. Let's take a look at the Land Rover pitcher scatter report to support what Bobby just said. Single minded in 20. His last 20 starts only two extra base hits to left handed batters as Bobby Mercer just said groundhog he leads the National League in 14 double plays and he relies on his defense. He doesn't have an overpowering fastball you see a lot of change in speed he throws a little breaking ball and a change up. He's got 72 in the third innings he's only got 42 strikeouts. One one. There's a strike. Jeter did not like that call. And 
and the one two just missed IO digital cable is the exclusive official HD sponsor for Yankees telecast on yes just underway here at the stadium Yankees have won four in a row Pirates scored a run in the first inning off Clemens and the 2-2 drilled down the left field line it is a base hit and it goes to the wall Heading to third is Johnny Damon. Bay plays it out in the outfield, fires it in, and Damon will stop at third. It's a double for Jeter, and the Yankees are set up. Second and third, nobody out. People have been wondering why Derek Jeter is a better hitter now than he was when he first came up. Well, that's the reason why. He's able to hit that inside pitch. And with authority down the left field line, he's also able to take it the opposite way. But Jeter has uh, really... Worked on that, and right now it's got him hitting 332 coming into this game. You can see Johnny Damon and boy Larry Boa put the brakes on. You can see Larry right there. Uh, Johnny Damon, nobody out. So now the Yankees have runners at second and third. With two ground balls, the Yankees could take a lead. That would be to the right side. At least one of them does this one. But looking for more. There's a ground ball, but back to the pitcher. Checks Damon and fires the first one away. Now, if you're the Pirates, I know it's early. First inning, do you walk A Rod to set up a double play? I don't think so. I think you go ahead and pitch A Rod, but you pitch to him very carefully, kind of like they were doing last night uh, to Johnny Damon. I mean, it's one of those. Uh, I don't know how do you explain yeah, it. It's, it's one of those uh, pitch to him, pitch around him. It's 0-2 the entire bat. You make a quality pitch, which is expanding the zone, allow the hitter to either swing at your pitch. If he doesn't, you walk him. Then you got a double play situation. Too early in the game to be walking. Potentially walking. It doesn't look good. Looks like you're scared, and you should be. <laughs> <laughs> Count one and zero. Now, Al, when you say you, you, it's like you 0-2 all the time, isn't that kind of a cop out? I mean, what if the pitcher makes a location mistake? And well, then that, then it's on you. You realize the situation. You have an open base, switch hitter and Posada, but you have an opportunity to make good pitches if you walk them. So what? Now you got a double play. You got any base force? Breaking ball strike. They laid that one right over the plate. Well, it's two breaking balls in a row. If a Hollum would be making a mistake if he if he threw a rod anything that uh, was knee high, it's got to be knee high down. At this level, major league pitchers, quality major league pitchers, has the ability to not be defensive, but to make a quality pitch. A quality pitch is a two strike pitch and to expand the zone, whether down or off the plate. Count two and one. Yeah, you you say that, but uh, the the guys that do make the quality pitch, you know, when they're behind in the count, are the guys that you see that are winning every year. Well, not everybody can do that. You're right, and it's not that easy, but your better pitchers do that yeah. often. You're right. It's a matter of execution of quality pitch. Damon's at third, and Cheater at second. Infield is still back. The 2 1. And there's a ground ball at third. That's going to get a run in. He thought about going home, almost missed the play at first. But he does get A Rod. A Rod drives in his 57th run, and the game is tied at 1. Well, last night, Jose Batista made a mistake in a similar situation where he checked the third runner at third base and then actually didn't have enough time, and it was a base hit. A bit of an experienced play last night, and he barely got A-Rod there. Somebody must be yelling at Batista over there. That's very uh, odd that he would do that two days in a row. Uh, and he almost lost the play at first there, as he did yesterday. And his play yesterday went a long way toward the Yankees scoring in the 10th inning. Here's Posada. And a breaking ball just missed. Well, there's one thing that you know right now, I mean, uh, based on the last uh, two days, is that if you're a runner, a Yankee runner at third base, and there's a ground ball to Batista, uh, you can upset him a little bit if you if you kind of mess around there at third base. So line drive off the glove of a leaping Wilson into left field. Here comes Jeter. Here's the throw. He's in there. Paulino could not handle the ball. Posada advances to second. It's an RBI single for the Yankee catcher, and the Yankees lead two to one. Beautiful swing by Posada, which he has been swinging the bat uh, extremely well. And 
Jeter with his good speed. I mean, that ball got out there in a hurry. I mean, that was uh, slammed, and Jason Bay put a nice throw there, but Jeter knocked the ball out of Paulino's hand. And when that happened, Posada went on into second base. Wow. The dangerous slide, and yeah, he had not even touched the home plate until he went back to touch it the second time. Wow, look at that left ankle. That is. You just uh, keep your fingers crossed uh, because that was very dangerous. That could have been serious. How about the scoring on that play? They give him a single and an RBI, and they give Bay an error, allowing Posada to move to second. That is wow. a tough error. That wasn't a bad throw. No. I've always been the big believer that uh, in, on a play like that, the bang bang play, that you need to. If, the, if that catcher is blocking the plate instead of trying to do that there because you can hurt yourself worse here than running into the guy. I mean you're better off uh, going ahead and making a collision at home plate because you got the momentum that's pushing you forward. He's just sitting there. Even if he's like 250. Even if he's 250. You know, moving 180 is causes more damage than standing 250. I think so. And Bobby's right. If you look at that replay, how, how Jeter's left ankle dangerously tilted, you, know, you just worry about that. Well, what he does is he forces you to slide outside and try to reach back and get it with your hand. And I think uh, Derek thought that he could slide uh, closer to the plate, but uh, that was uh, very close to being a serious accident. Check out his left ankle. See that there? Watch this here. Whoa. Ooh. Oh, my goodness. Lucky he has high tops on Oh, my. Oh, my. And he never did reach the, he never did reach the home plate. He had to go back and touch it again. Well, that's what catchers are taught to do. Get, get up in front of the oh, home yeah. plate a little bit. When you get ready for the play, get in front of the runner. You're either going to take it or do what Dieter did and try to slide around it. Well, Matsui walks. Here's Cano. <laughs> Cano 13 for his last 35, hitting 268. And there's a strike. Along with Bobby Mercer and Al Leiter, I'm Michael Kay. You're watching Yankees baseball here on Yes on this Saturday afternoon. Yankees lead 2 to 1 in the first. Ground ball left side, backhanded, and off the glove of Wilson into left field. Here comes Posada, and the throw is cut off. Throw to third, not in time. What and Cano that? moves to second. What was that? Three to one, Yanks. Awful throw by oh, Bay. I, I don't know what that was, uh, but that was that was not a good play at all. I think I don't know what happened to Bay there. Either he got caught in between, he was going to throw it home, then change his mind, and just kind of threw a grenade up there. Was Jason Bay? He's going to try to get the guy at home, and all of a sudden he just kind of threw it up in the air, allowed the runner to go to third, and also, more importantly, allowed the other runner to go to second base. Wow. He was not committed at all. And Jim Colburn, the pitching coach, goes out and talks with Mahalam. Yankees baseball is broadcast in Spanish. It's available by hitting the SAP button on your television. SAP is brought to you by Toyota. A smart way to keep moving forward. Well, Roger Clemens is not used to this. As we mentioned, over the past three years, the Astros did not score for him. So he gave up a run in the first, and the Yankees have promptly answered with three and threatening for more. In his three seasons with the Astros, they scored just 3.6 runs per game for him. Well, I know Al can uh, probably allude to this a little bit better, but I think when you when you know you have an offense like the Yankees have, uh, and you're Roger Clemens or any other pitcher you go out there, I mean you go out there with a little looser uh, repertoire, and, and and you know you don't have to feel like you have to be so fine in order to get everybody up because you you have confidence that your team, if you get a couple runs, they're going to get a couple runs back for and you. Hitting counts, two zero, two one, three one counts that are normally where a hitter should drive it. You don't have to be as careful in the sense of having to be on the corners all the time, knowing that if it's a hit and a run, it's not a loss. And when you have a team that hasn't scored for you, as, as in Houston for Roger, you're thinking the run is a loss and not just a run to make the, co the score closer or make it difficult for your team to come back. Now, if you're keeping a score at home, amazingly, that was just scored in E6. Cano was not given a base hit. 
going to be kidding me. Well, that was scored at E6. Very odd. Now, Clemens has been sitting. And here's the play. You decide. Well, it hit, the, his glove. It hit it, the lip. It hit the lip of the grass. That is a terrible call. Oof. Well, now they've just changed yeah. it back to a single in RBI. Bobby, did you bring your whiteout with you? My whiteout? Yeah. <laughs> no, I brought my eraser. <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford whiteout. <laughs> So now Cano is a little happier at second uh, base. Be a little happier, and it's the right call. Now Clemens has been sitting on the bench during this half inning for about 15 minutes. And there's a chopper to Bautista across the diamond, and that will do it. As the Yankees get three runs on four hits, one error, and two left. Derek Jeter started the game. Smiling with Roger Clemens, they're back together, then contributes to this rally with a double and also a run score. Three to one Yankees as we go to <laughs> Through the years with Roger Clemens from Boston to Toronto to the Yankees to Houston and now back to the Yankees here as he enters his second inning of work leading three to one. And the first pitch is upstairs one and oh. Three four and oh Yanks one two and one Pirates. Is there a concern now 15 minutes on the bench and you see everything that he's done with the teams that we mentioned with the Blue Jays by the way two straight Cy Young awards and with the Yankees two ch championships. But the sitting on the bench for 15 minutes will that affect the groin problem. No, 15 minutes is in the half hour and I don't know too many major league pitchers that wouldn't uh, take a three spot in the bottom of the first. 38 and 18 with his hometown Houston Astros. And here he is starting a second tour of duty with the New York Yankees. Clemens was supposed to pitch on Monday and then that was termed a fatigue groin kind of scratched himself. He called up Joe Torre said I don't think I can go. Uh, then worked out felt OK and here he is starting here at the stadium against the Pirates. Driven down the right field line it is a base hit that'll go to the wall played out there by Abreu and Domit is going to go to second with a double. So lead off double for Ryan Domit. Roger getting in a 2 1 fastball count. You see where Jorge Posada is setting up. It's supposed to be outside corner, and that ball was middle in, thigh high, and Ryan Domit got the barrel of the bat out, kept his hands inside, keeping that ball fair. Roger's been settling in right around that 90 mark, 91 mile hour mark. That fastball was 89. Not as overpowering as he's been, but certainly more than enough if he's hitting corners like that. The pitch of Paulino is a strike. A lot of people have asked, well, why, why is Clemens not going to spring training with teams? He didn't do it last year with the Astros and this year with the uh, the Yankees. And really, well, there, there are two reasons. One, he can do it because he can do whatever he wants because he's Roger Clemens. And, and number two, there's a general belief, and I think Roger feels this as well, that he can no longer at his age give you a full six months of a season and 35 starts the body won't hold up and he's kind of estimated that well, starting sometime in June was probably a best chance. Uh, well I totally agree with that and uh, uh, this is uh, in spring training spring training just visiting that yeah but uh, I, you know there's nobody that knows their body better than uh, than uh, the person. So Roger Clemens knows his body and he knows what uh, what he can get out of his body and it worked for him in Houston. So uh, he, like you said Roger is who he is and with his resume he can do whatever he wants to. The people wants his services they're going to have to kind of go along with with what he thinks is right for him. After the age of 40 he's won 60 games. Phil Necro with 121. And Paulino down on strikes that's the third strikeout for Clemens. I mean, every player in the world would love to be able to come back, you know, midway through the season and uh, pick up where they left off. 
Roger getting ahead with his fastball, and then he comes back with a fastball that looked like a strike. You saw that two seam movement. Now that was a split that was inside. Ron Polino making a terrible hack on that. That's a tough split finger right there. Outer half, you saw it drop about a foot. That combination that Rogers come up with fastball split in the latter part of his career has been devastating at times. Pits to Jack Wilson as a strike. You know, for as much as Roger Clemens still is a power pitcher, today he hasn't touched in that mid 90s. Maybe he will, maybe won't, but that split finger out of the hand looks like a two seam fastball and drops as much as it does really helped him in the latter part of his career. Count 0 and 2. He's got a great delivery, as good as anybody I've ever seen. Uses his lower half. Excellent. It's all about legs, torso. He talks about you know, good core, legs, stomach. The 0 2. And the count 1 and 2. Just like a hitter, I mean, a hitter sets his mechanics up with his lower body. Uh, you can see how strong the Clemens floor body is. And uh, like Al was saying, he's got a beautiful delivery and and uh, his drop and drive is for a power hitter, a uh, power pitcher. You know, as you get a little older, the, the stride leg, the left leg here, doesn't go out as far. But you see, Roger, usually it's about the height of, of the pitcher. If you're 6'3 or so, your, your, your stride's going to be around six feet. The, the thro pitchers that throw with lesser velocity have shorter strides. And you saw there with Roger getting out with his left side getting out of the front. Today's close captioning is brought to you by your New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut Lexus dealers. I mean, for, for Roger to to do what he's done especially in recent times what he did in Houston you could say it's National League and it's not as good he had unbelievable ERA very low he still has maintains above average stuff but you got to have a consistent delivery consistent release point and he's done that he's maintained it because of his work ethic being strong and maintaining his body enough to be able to repeat a good quality delivery. The thing they say about older players is they still can play on the field. They, they never lose that desire, but what they lose is the desire to prepare and put the work in so that they can be successful. And that's what's really startling about Clemens. He, he works harder than 20 year olds. And he has been doing that for many, many years. And that's where, that, and you're right, that's the reason he's able to perform at this level at the, the age of 44. Uh, but Rogers really had no real setbacks you know uh, when he has been injured most of it's been uh, in the legs you know in the groin and the hamstring so like you say that uh, workout that uh, that he has been doing for so many years and not even uh, the 20 or 25 year olds can do the same type of workout that he does and and that's been the most important to his longevity now one guy who's taken that workout and run with it is Andy, Andy Pettit. Pettit yeah and Andy's become bigger and stronger but when he was here with the Yankees sometimes some of the younger pitchers would go out and try to keep up with him and they would get physically yeah. ill in the outfield and they would stop right because they couldn't do it they just couldn't physically handle it. this will be Clemens 39th pitch of the game the 2 2 driven out into left center field Matsui is there and he'll put it away for the second out of the seven. It's overcast here at the stadium. The lights are on. And certainly it seems as if rain is in the air. It wasn't in the forecast, Number but uh, it is certainly overcast. Well, I think with Roger, he's a fan of the game. He's always been a fan of the game, admired the, the previous pitchers before him. Number one pick at the University of Texas. He's a baseball player. And when he s sees his name, He's uh, eighth all time in career wins. He's coming up on Kid Nichols and you put him in the names of Christy Matheson and Grover Alexander, and Walter Johnson, Cy Young. That matters to him. You know, you, you have many different reasons after you establish yourself and you, you, you've been taken care of financially and, and you've maintained uh, the success of major league pitchers. You got to have other reasons to keep you going. Most of the time, it's about winning championships, all the time, hopefully. So 
Well, Roger, he, he respects the game. That's what uh, Al was talking about. There you can see where Roger at 348, looking for 349 tonight. But uh, he respects the game. He respects the uniform. And uh, this has become a ritual now with Roger Clemens. Before he starts every game, he puts a little sweat on, off his brow on the top of Babe Ruth. And he's appreciative of what Babe Ruth meant to this uh, this industry and this, in this game for so many years. It still does. And the Yankees have retired Babes number three out there in Monument Park. The two one. That splitter's working today. Yeah. He calls it Mr. Splitty. He can call it whatever he wants to call it. This is pretty good uh, splitty. Well, that's the pitch that has revolutionized baseball since uh, Bruce Souter brought it on when he was with the Chicago Cubs back in the 70s. Dribbled slowly. Clemens off the mound. Bare hands. Fires. Got him. Clemens quickly off the mound and fired a strike to Josh Phelps to get out of the inning. So the leadoff double is wasted. Off the mound quickly, legs look fine. No runs to hit, no errors, and one man left. Clemens likes what he sees. We go to the bottom of the second. New York Yankees baseball on Yes is brought to you in part by Continental Airlines, the official airline of the Yankees. Jeep, a growing lineup of legendary vehicles and by IO Digital Cable, the leader in HD, and HD is free with IO. Roger Clemens has thrown 44 pitches through two innings. And we go to the bottom of the second. Yankees lead 3-1. to one. Melky Cabrera against Paul Mahalem. And a buck, but a buck foul. It'll be Cabrera, Damon, and Jeter. 9-1-2 and two in the Yankee order against the Pirates left-handed. Uh, that'll help Melky because uh, when you do that once in a while, and Melky's a pretty good bunter, and he should uh, he should show that bunt uh, ever so often, that'll loosen the infield up. He hits a lot of ground balls, and and just the fact that they know in the back of their minds that Melky can bunt and bunt for a base hit, uh, it allows uh, him to get uh, more base hits to go through the, uh, through the infield because they've loosened up a bit. Count two and one. That one is punched out in the right field. Coming in and diving is Domit to put it away for the first out. Let's take a look now at the JR Music and Computer World upcoming schedule. One more game against the Pirates. That's tomorrow on Yes. One o'clock start. Twelve o'clock is our batting practice show. And then the Angels come into town. Monday's an off day. Tuesday game is on my nine at seven. I'm sorry, that's Arizona. I said the Angels. Wednesday at seven, uh, Yes Network. Six o'clock is the batting practice show. And Thursday, uh, Thursday matinee also on Yes. So one o'clock first pitch start. And the pitch to Damon is low 1 0. So the Yankees in the middle of an interleague stretch. After the Diamondbacks, the Mets come into Yankee Stadium. Count 2 0. The uh, Pittsburgh Pirates uh, are in a stretch of 15 straight games against Miracle League Club. Ground ball to first. LaRoche takes it himself and there's two away. In the National League, if you got 15 consecutive games versus American League clubs, you'll get the you'll get the uh, the overall message that this is a sluggers league over here. Well, and you mentioned that with the 10 inning game yesterday, we talked about it. National League, you don't need seven or eight relievers. And uh, Jim Tracy, the manager of the Pirates, used everybody except two of the guys down in this bullpen and one of the guys he used had to put on the DL Solomon Torres yesterday after the game put on the DL dribbled slowly to short Jack Wilson charges and a one two three inning for Paul Mahalo and the Pirates we play two here at the stadium Yankees lead the Pirates three to one on Rocket 
relaunch day at the stadium. Let's turn back the clock to May 15th, 1984. Roger Clemens' first start. A little younger, a little thinner, facing the Cleveland Indians. Did not get a decision in this game, but he did strike out his first four batters in the big leagues. That's Joe Carter there. And uh, Roger Clemens now, 24 years later, here on the mound at Yankee Stadium. I retired just in time. Just missed him, <laughs> Retired huh? in 83, yeah. <laughs> five and two-thirds against the Indians. 11 hits, five runs, three walks, four strikeouts. And five days later, he actually picked up his first Major League victory. Boy, in this day and age, you see the Coors Light scoreboard, the Yankees leading 3-1. There's no escaping the fact that you're getting old because those pictures are right there. You don't have to thumb through an album. And they're nice and, you know, they're in color. Well, Bobby, when you started, I mean, they were artist sketch, so I mean, it's hard why, to see. Why were you looking at me? You <laughs> looked me right in the eye when he was talking about, you know, there's no, there's no getting around it when you get older, you know. <laughs> Clemens has been around so much that he actually faced his pitching coach twice, Ron Guidry, when Guidry right. was pitching for the Yanks, and they went one and one each. We, we've shown now your first year with the Yankees. I mean, do you look at that and go, wow, I really look young? Yeah, I said, wow, what, where did the 20 pounds go? <laughs> <laughs> or come from? And then you can see. <laughs> <laughs> I I just feel my belly. 3-2. <laughs> I think the players were uh, smaller back in those days. I mean, uh, today, you know, back in... When I hate to use the word back in those days, but I'm talking about 30 years ago, you know, 40 years ago. They didn't allow them to use uh, weights to uh, get themselves uh, physically fit to play baseball. Today, uh, weights is the biggest part of the game. And Bautista walks. Let's check out the Dunkin' Donuts team scouting report, and let's take a look at what the Pittsburgh Pirates are all about. Well, let's take a look at that. 1992, the last time that the not only did they make the playoffs, but they had a 500 record. Pirate Treasure, what a, what a franchise since 1882. They've been a major league team, seven trips to the World Series, five of them they've won. The last one was in 1979 over the Orioles. And 27th, they're 27th in payroll. And in this day and age, if you're going to be that low in team payroll, you better have an awfully good minor league system and great player development. Here's Freddie Sanchez. And you know what else you can't do? If you can have a low payroll, you can't make mistakes. You can't trade Oliver Perez for Xavier Nady. You just can't do it. You can't give up a left-handed pitcher who throws 95 miles an hour. Every decision you make has to be correct because you cannot absorb the monetary loss if you make a mistake. And you have to start with pitching. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we talk about the foundation, you know, of Roger Clemens being the lower part, also with hitters. Well, same thing with an organization. If you can start with pitching and and do that, you're going to go a long way. Let's see if they turn two. There's one. And there's two. Six, four, three double play as Clemens gets Sanchez to bang to the shortstop Jeter. Well, a nice hop for Derek and a, and a perfect flip to Cano. And Cano with that uh, strong arm of his. Uh, not too many runners can outrun run that ball. Jason Bay. Here's Jason Bay. Clemens trying to get through this inning without throwing 22 pitches. That's what he's done in his first two innings with 44 total. So he's thrown 10 so far this inning. And the 0-1. Fastball high. Well, Jason Bay has done something uh, neither Roberto Clemente or Willie Stargell or Barry Bonds did when he played for the uh, when they played for the Pirates. Uh, Jason Bay is the first Pirate to win Rookie of the Year honors back in 19, uh, back in 2004. High fly ball, right field. A 12-pitch inning for Clements. And he faces the minimum three Pirates. No runs, no hits, no errors. And because of the double play, nobody left. We go to the bottom of the third. 3-1 Yankees. Hey, tomorrow's starting pitchers are brought to you by Verizon Fios. Make the switch to Verizon Fios, TV, Internet, and phone. Former Yankee Sean Chacon back in the rotation, 2-0, 3.26. And Tyler Clippard, the youngster who started this four-game winning streak, 
He's 3-1 and one for the Yankees with a very representative 3.60 ERA. Our batting practice show is at noon. And first pitch right around 107. So please tune in to Yes for the final of this three-game set. Here's Bobby Abreu against Paul Mahalam. And there's a strike. Coors Light scoreboard, 3-4 and 0 Yankees. 1-3 and 1 for the Pirates. Now you see right before Mahalo delivers the pitch, kind of shaking his glove. You don't know if he's trying to get the grip on the baseball or if it's a distraction to the batter, but we'll see when he starts to do the windup. Well, what was that? Was that trying to get the grip? I'll tell you, I, and, I, and I haven't seen him close enough, but I know at this level, and Bobby could help us on this, that the, there's times when pitchers give away pitches, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe uh, the pitching coach or somebody says, hey, you're, you're squeezing on a fastball and you're flaring your glove on a breaking ball. So what you do as a pitcher, you just mess with it. You just wiggle it enough to where if there is something that they're picking up, they're not going to pick it up now. Abreu flying down the line as Freddy Sanchez just gets him on the ground ball a second. And there are some coaches that just sit on the bench and are just there to pick something up. And then, it, then it's up to the hitter. If a, if a hitter wants to take it, he can take it. I know Joe Carter used to love to want to know what the, what the uh, pitcher was throwing and, and somebody could pick something up. Cito Gaston, the manager of the Blue Jays for many years, he was a great guy to pick things up. You know, and it, the nuance is so small. You know, if, if you just tilt your glove a little bit. I remember Cito used to say on my slider, I'd pull my hands back toward the second baseman, and on my fastball, I would pick it up toward the first baseman. That's amazing. Now, the, uh, the, the short two years that I played with Mantle, I think Mickey was probably as good as anybody at picking up a flaw in a pitcher, get, uh, tipping his pitches off. Uh, they used to always go to Mickey, you know, and ask him uh, if he saw anything with the starting pitcher because... Uh, I mean, just the slightest little flaw, you know what I'm saying? And every pitcher has tendencies. Uh, and uh, he can be able to pick up a, a curveball or, or, you know, a breaking pitch or a fastball or whatever it is. I mean, there's several different things that they do, and Al's alluded to some of them, but uh, this thing that he does with his glove, we're talking about Hollum. Right. I, I think it's just a habit that he's gotten into. I don't think there's anything there to. To throw anybody off that's Jim Colburn the pitching coach and like Al said they they watch them all the time they watch the film and make sure they're not tipping pitches if you remember uh, the last time Andy Pettit was with the Yankees mm -hmm. there was uh, some talk that Andy was tipping pitches. Well, that, that's what I, I want to allude to uh, Randy Johnson his whole career and and Randy got to a point where he knew he knew hitters knew it Joe McEwing had like five hits lifetime four of them home runs and he knew it was coming. It was pretty blatant. He was he was a guy that squeezed his glove on mm -hmm. a fastball and would just keep it normal uh, fan, what you call fan. The glove would just stay open mm -hmm. on his slider. And guys, you saw it. You saw it. it was and Randy today. knew it, but he wouldn't change. You know what? I think it got to enough to with Randy where he, you know it just became something else to think about. And and some guys, you know, Randy Johnson, 95 to 100 miles an hour with a slider that drops off back leg on a, on a right-handed batter. He didn't care. When you have that kind of stuff, you can make a lot of mistakes and. And make up for it as a result of velocity. Mm -hmm. A Rod works a walk along with Bobby Mercer and Al Leiter. I'm Michael K. You're watching Yankees baseball right here on the Yes Network. We're in the bottom of the third inning, and the Yankees lead the Pirates three to one here on a Saturday afternoon. You know, some some teams, really good teams, will scout themselves. They'll send scouts to their games so they could see if a scout can pick up any tendencies on his team. Sometimes it's really smart to scout yourself. Yeah, and another thing is the third base coach can pick up uh, what the pitcher is throwing to and relay a message to the hitter because he sees a lot of times you can see the grip when he goes into to, to grip the baseball to throw it. The third base coach can and and either whistle or get on his knee or whatever it is to, to tip the other uh, to tip the hitter off. Yeah, that that I have a problem. With. In between the lines, that's okay. I think you just well, you better do it very discreetly, otherwise you're going to get hurt. <laughs> now, Randy, as Al said, has been tipping pitches for a long time. He's done okay in the comparison with Randy and the Rocket. And uh, you know, Randy was here last year. Rocket's here this year. They're very close in strikeouts. You said he did okay. Yeah, he did okay. <laughs> Five Cy Youngs, two no hitters. He's 17 away from the Magic 300. He's going to the Hall of Fame. Posada could not hold up one and two. And, and you mentioned Pettit. 
in game six of that series against the Diamondbacks in 2001. I think they, they lost 10 nothing, and a lot of people felt that Andy was tipping his pitches. Well, you know, uh, uh, Randy Johnson, when he was here with the Yankees, uh, they watched him very closely because uh, the way he was being hit, you know, with his with his fastball and his slider, they thought that people were picking pitches up. Well, it, Bobby, it was so blatant, and, and having played with him a little bit that year in 05, you know, I'd sit on the bench here at Yankee Stadium, your first base side, so it's very easy to see the left-handed pitcher as you see this view from here from the first first base camera well, and you could see his glove. And it was it was obvious mm -hmm. every pitch. I would, you know, I caught it. So runner goes, throw to second, not in time, and Paulino throws out runners at about a 43% clip so a rod got a good jump on Mahalam and Paulina had no chance that he got a good pitch he saw the tremendous jump there forget about it he he was taken off and there's certain little nuances that a pitch will show you saw a rod was almost a running start no chance and as you said Michael 43 percent Ronnie polino has got a very very good strong arm good catcher Now Randy Johnson who's on the Diamondbacks again Yankees traded him during the offseason he's not even coming to New York for the trip. Oh he's not? No. Yeah you know, they talk about Clemens family plan and I believe that Randy has already missed three road trips and you know series that he's not pitching he just doesn't go he didn't come to Shea Stadium. Maybe he didn't want to deal with any camera crews on the street. That was an inauspicious beginning for him here with the Yankees. Tom Glavin I think has missed a couple of uh, road trips for the Mets and you might agree or disagree with Clemens having the family plan but others kind of have a very quiet family plan that sometimes they don't have to take uh, take road trips as Posada goes down swinging two away. Well you know personally uh, uh, I wouldn't have a problem with Roger Clemens and the uh, family plan uh, if we know that uh, uh, at least I would feel from a from a teammate of, of, of Clemens that the fact that I feel like he's given his all and uh, we got a good chance to win with him out there and uh, uh, if we don't see him uh, until the until the day he pitches uh, that'd be fine with that'd be fine with me as a player. Here's a Deki Matsui. Not everybody could do that. You know people don't realize this Bobby but I also have a family. It's just with my cell phone. Yeah, I understand. Your, and your, and your Blackberry, email, and your yeah. Blackberry, because yeah. you were you email and you take emails. And, I mean, you're working all the time, even when you're working. <laughs> That's why I need the family plan. It's cheaper. The 1-0. -oh. Grounded towards second. Sanchez is right there, and uh, that will do it. Here in the third. No runs, no hits, no errors, and one man left on base. We played three at the stadium. Yankees three and the Pirates one. The second coming of Roger Clemens to the Bronx. Those were the first three innings, and it comes out the Yankees three, Pirates one. And we go to the fourth inning. Adam LaRoche, who singled in a run in the first inning, will lead off against Clemens. And there's a strike. Clemens got to the ballpark very early today. He uh, met with uh, Joe Torrey and Ron Guidry for about, I guess, 40 minutes behind closed doors. Then spent a lot of time in the trainer's room. And then he walked out to his locker, same spot as his locker was when uh, he was here the first time. And I was standing there with Bob Clapp as a writer for the record in New Jersey. And uh, he said, hey, guys. Uh, I can't talk. I've got to get my brain together for the game. So he gets into a mindset. It's almost he, he's, he almost brings a football mentality to baseball. Heard a story when he was in Tampa. You know, he pitched the A ball game in Tampa. He worked so much with the young pitchers with, that were down there, and it was such value to guys like Phil Hughes and Jober Chamberlain and a lot of the youngsters, a lot of the young power pitchers as well. One, Bobby and I heard a story today. That he had about five or six pitchers, and he was he was standing in front of a mirror, and he was trying to show them exactly how to generate power, and he couldn't get the words right on how he wanted to uh, to, do to convey it. Yeah. So he said, "Wait a second, guys." So he gets them all around a phone, and he calls up Nolan Ryan, and Nolan Ryan over the speakerphone puts it into words on how to do it, and that's the value that he's bringing to these young players in the Yankee system. And, and yeah, he was getting ready at A ball, Double A, and Triple A. But imagine if you're a kid whose dream is to make the big leagues. 
It's almost like learning to pitch from Picasso or learning to paint with Picasso in front of you. And, and Roger Clemens is very giving of his time with these young players. Strike three as LaRoche goes down looking. Strikeout number four. Yeah, we had a shot of uh, Tyler Clifford, who's going to be pitching tomorrow. He's following Roger Clemens. I had a chance to uh, uh, to visit with Tyler uh, today in the clubhouse. Uh, and I was asking him, I said, have you ever met Roger Clemens? And he said, no, I've never met the Rock. And he said, that's one of the things I want to try to do today is to give a chance to say hello to Roger. And I said, you think you'll learn something from him? He said, you know, I sure hope so. Uh, I, I feel very confident in that, he said, uh, but I, I, I'm really looking forward to meeting Roger. He's getting an up-close look at him, and he's going to follow him in the rotation. What a thrill for a 22-year-old kid. And, fouls the bat. and I was telling him just what you were saying uh, about that story there. I said, well, Tyler, don't be bashful. I said, Roger is here to help you, too. I said, you just watch him, and, and if you've got something you need to ask him, I said, just tap him on the shoulder and ask him. He'd be more than happy to relay whatever information or experience that he has about doing cer certain things. I think he enjoys it, Bobby. He doesn't he even does look at it as an imposition. He does enjoy it. I, I was lucky enough this winter, I hosted a, a St. John's baseball benefit at the New York Athletic Club, and he's friends with the St. John's baseball coach. And I was in the room as he talked to their baseball team, and he spoke for an hour off the cuff, and the kids just ate it up. I mean, you're listening to Roger Clemens. Pitch is high. And imagine having, you know, Nolan Ryan on speed dial. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty nice. <laughs> speed dial, huh? Speed Two down. power pitchers. Speed, yeah. speed <laughs> there <down>. you go. <laughs> 27 years, Nolan Ryan, 24 for Columbus. That's 51 years of experience you're getting. Now, Al, I know you have Sandy Koufax on speed dial. That's a pretty big deal. Well, you know, I, I, as I'm listening to you guys, I, I thought about one of the spring trainings with the Mets in Port St. Lucie, and Sandy Koufax is friends with uh, with Fred Wilpon, the owner of the Mets. Sandy came around. He was sitting with, I think, John Franco and I, and we just started talking about curveballs or something. And before you know it, I was unaware of it because we were just captivated, as you described it, with Roger in, in Tampa. There's a base hit up the middle for Nady. And we turn around, not kidding, there's about 25 people. Just We pulled up chairs, and Sandy was just doing his thing. And it was just so neat. It was one of those moments that I'll never forget. You freeze it and realize that how, you know, another guy, Sandy, who is so wonderful with, right with, with people and wanting to give his, uh, his right information and knowledge, like Roger, what he does uh, in wanting to help. Not only to young players, to anybody. Here's a guy who's going down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, pitcher. You can learn from him. I don't care if you're Mike Messina or Andy Pettit or, or Tyler Clipper. Brian Domit, there's a strike. And there are some players. I mean, we're not going to try to paint everybody with the same brush. There are some veterans that don't want to be bothered. You know, they want to. It's their job. They want to. They want to pitch. They want to do their job. And they're not there to be a teacher. They're not a coach. But Clemens really seems like he enjoys it. He wants to pass on the knowledge. He does it with his four sons, and he tries to do it with the young players that he, he's around all the time. He did it with the Houston Astros, same deal. There's that splitter in the count 0-2. Well, you know, the Rock is very much a family man, and uh, I think he, uh, you know, the team that he plays for, those teammates are his family. And so he treats them, treats them basically the same way he'd treat his own family. Saw Clemens at 70 pitches right now here in the fourth inning. Runner on first base. They're not holding Nady. His legs are bothered by hamstring problems. And Gomit goes down swinging. Five strikeouts for Clemens. Let's take a look at the Aflac trivia question here in the top of the fourth inning. I'm sure it's going to be about the rocket. I'm, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm just guessing. Let's see if the duck knows. Jorge Posada has caught 138 games for Clemens. Who is the only other catcher to have caught, caught 100 plus games for Columbus? I think I know the answer to this, but we can't guess. I'm allowed to guess. Just guess the wrong answer? No, because then I'll mislead our, our viewers. Pitches inside the polling. Huh? I think the answer, I'll give a clue though, that person is in the ballpark to me. Stop right there. It's too right. much information. Uh, you're right. I'm sorry. Roger so far has shown a very good split finger. You saw the previous at bat against Ryan Doman. Just three splits in a row. There it is again. His velocity is right in that upper 80 range. A little bit less than, than what people have seen in the past. But he's spotting it. You see good movement. But that split finger, this ball coming out of his hands. Look at that. That's a great shot right there. Split finger in between the two seams. It tumbles out. Looks like a fastball. 
about seven miles an hour slower than his fastball. Are you alarmed at all, Al, that the, the velocity is 89? No, you know what? It looks like he's just kind of, I, I don't want to, I know he's a he's an all-out guy and he's going to empty the tank, but it doesn't look like he's really forcing anything. I don't know how you see that, Bobby, but, you know, he's just real calm and, you know, good fluid delivery. He's not overthrowing. I think he's aware that the velocity isn't in the low 90s, and when you real recognize that, you, you are so much more conscious of hitting your spot, locating the ball, keeping the ball down. And he doesn't appear to be struggling uh, to try to get the ball over. You know, we've seen Roger at times uh, miss outside, miss high like he did there, miss inside, not able to, to, to even get close to the strike zone. And that's when you, you, you see him struggling a little bit, sweating and walking around the mound. 3-1. Fouled the other way. Abreu gives it a look but runs out of room. It's not uncomfortable here at the stadium. It's 78 degrees. There's a little bit of a breeze and slight wind blowing. You look at the flags over the stadium. They're blowing from left to right. That doesn't mean that's the way they would affect play, but that's certainly the way the flags are flapping. And the lights have been on since the first inning, so it's somewhat overcast. It's not an overly humid day. Runner goes and it's fouled away. Runner will go again. That's Nady at first. Two outs and a 3 2 count on Paulino. Just missed outside. So Paulino walks, and the Pirates have runners on first and second with two outs. Yeah, this ball is just off the plate. Roger yanked it a little bit. You see the ball cutting off the, the outside corner. And Jack Ronnie Paulino's previous at bat, he was in a similar count. And Roger threw a little split finger. Roger trying to paint the outside corner, just missed. So here's Jack Wilson. Three to one Yankees lead top of the fourth. And the pitch outside one and oh he's been right around 90 all day at the beginning of the game watching the gun he was about 92 and that's with the adrenaline kicking in but he's calmed down just a bit so he's about 90 89 90 but the splitter is also in the upper 80s so that's what makes it such an effective pitch 79 pitches for Clemens and Torrey said yesterday that he's going to start looking at about 90 start paying attention at 90. He is not on a pitch count. The 1 0. 2 and 0. Well, you mentioned about a pitch count and uh, the 90 pitch mark. These last few pitches he, he left the ball up. And that's usually the first sign of somebody getting a little tired and as much as Roger uses his lower half. It's an indication that he's he's perhaps a little tired. There's a strike. Took a little something off that fastball to count two and one. And the 2 1 pitch. Driven out to right field. Fairly deep. Backing up Abreu. It's over his head. And one hop up against the wall. Nady scores. Paulino rounds third. He will score. It's a two run double for Jack Wilson. And we are tied at three. Well, it appeared that uh, Bobby Abreu is going to catch up with this fly ball to Gap in right center field. Uh, that's a slicing line drive into right center. And the ball normally is coming back to the outfielder, and Abreu just could not catch up with it. I don't know whether Bobby thought off the bat of Jack Wilson. It wasn't hit as firmly and as hard as it was, as his initial first step seemed to be directly toward center field as opposed to toward the wall. It had a little slicing effect, and it just kept sailing.
So here's Chris Duffy. Duffy hit that inside the park home run yesterday, a two run home run. Gave the Pirates a 4 2 lead. Talked to Pettit about it today. He said, I turned, and once I saw Melky take a step in, I knew he was in trouble. He said, because I could tell as a pitcher how hard that ball was hit. He said, and the balls were traveling yesterday. That one doesn't travel. It goes right into the glove of Phelps, and uh, that's going to do it here in the fourth inning. But the Pirates score two runs on two hits and one man left. He played three and a half. It's a 3 3 game. We go to the bottom of the fourth inning. It's a 3-3 game. Let's take a look at the Aflac trivia answer. It's about Posada catching 138 games for Clemens. Who's the only other catcher to have caught 100-plus games for Clemens? I think it's Tony Pena. Let's see. It is 111 games. Tony Pena, the Yankee first base coach. And that was when Roger and Tony were with the Red Sox. Cano leads off against Mahalam. It's a new game. It's 3-3. 3 5 and one for the Pirates and 3-4-0. For the Yankees. Bottom of the order for the Yankees Cano, Phelps, and Cabrera. Popped up behind the plate and out of play. Cano with an RBI single off the lip of the grass by shortstop. That was in the first inning. His 29th ribby. Toward the end of last year, I think the last 54 games, Cano averaged about an RBI a game, which is a great number for a guy at the bottom of the order. And Cano started this season really struggling, really laboring, but he has pushed the average up to 271. The 2 1. There's a breaking ball strike. Well, he is an exciting player. I mean, uh, th this kid here uh, has got a long ways to go. Uh, his potential is. It is wide and certainly his hitting potential. Uh, the one thing that a lot of young players do and uh, it's just it's just part of learning is that you got to be more patient at home plate. You got to give yourself a better chance. I mean you know when you fail 70 percent of the time anyway you got to give yourself a better chance to get a base hit and be successful. Samsung's four seasons of hope and Joe Torrey have teamed up to make a difference in the community for every Yankees home run hit at home this year. Samsung will donate $1,000 to Joe Torrey Safe at Home Foundation to help end the cycle of domestic violence. You can join the team and support Samsung's home run for kids by visiting fourseasonsofhope.com or joetorrey.org because a little hope can make a big difference. The pitch to Phelps is low 1-0. Phelps grounded to third. That was in the first. Yankees scored three runs in the bottom of the first inning, and that is all that Mahalam has given up. And the 1 0. Got to be a tough call for Torrey not to use Cairo every day, the way Cairo's been playing, especially defensively, but he likes what Phelps could do offensively. He knows he sacrificed something glove wise and Phelps picks up a single right there. He also knows that he's got to get his bench players in there every once in a while too. I mean you know Cairo has been playing consecutive games but uh, Phelps had been playing a lot of over at first base before Cairo got in there and it was McCavage and uh, and Phelps that was kind of platooning back and forth to first base. Doug Minkiewicz, who had played the majority of the games, is actually in the Yankee clubhouse today, and he has a, a cast on his uh, broken wrist. But uh, head-wise, he's fine. He really got roughed up in that game against the Red Sox, running into the thigh of, of Mike Lowell. Well, Mike Lowell ran into him. Head snapped back, but he's okay in terms of a concussion. But now he's just got to wait for the wrist to heal. Should be about six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Scary incident. He's going to get a pin inserted on Tuesday. Really? Mm -hmm. And that's going to speed up the healing, they say. I really, when I looked at that replay, I never really thought of anything about the wrist. You know, I was only worried about the neck and the head. I think the wrist initially got hurt in a play at second base, and he was playing with it, and then it actually um, got roughed up again in the collision at first base. And he had been playing really unbelievably beautiful first base first defensively. Base. I mean, some of the things that he was doing with the glove, he's a gold glove winner in 2001 
but um, his hitting was starting to come around and got some big hits and, and now he gets shut down. And this is the play and it's a scary play. Just watch the way his head jerks. Oh. Wow. Tough. I thought at that time there's a possibility he could have broken his neck. <laughs> and there's the cast we're talking about. Right wrist, obviously, in the cast, and the, all he can do is be a spectator now. And every player that you talk to say there is not, there's nothing more helpless than to be on the disabled list. You're part of the team, but you're kind of an outcast. There's very little you could do. It's kind of like the kid peering into the candy store with his nose pressed up against the window. Can't get any candy. The three-one. Line drive, left field, and it's a nice play by Bay, taking a base hit away from Cabrera as Phelps heads back to first. Wow, nice play by Jason Bay on that uh, shoot top line drive catch. This is the second time that Melky has hit the ball hard. He's come up with nothing. Last time he was robbed in right field. Good play by Bay there. give up just a screaming line drive like that you turn around and a great play is made behind you what's it feel like I mean you just feel like you escaped something I, I show no emotion no I've always thought that with you on the mound <laughs> you know you give up a rocket and you're just hoping and when it is a great play like that you just realize you, you got you got one you got it it probably and should have been it could have been a hit and your defense came through for you you ever think about uh, that guy better make the catch because if it gets by him, there's going to be a lot of running around these bases. Well, fielders don't mind if you show emotion, obviously, with the great play, but they absolutely cannot stand when a pitcher shows up if they make an error. They hate it, and that's and, and you're not supposed to do it. The one two. Yeah, I, I played with a couple of them, Dave Steve and Jack Morris. They they would they weren't afraid of just turning around and giving the what's that all about? Which is completely wrong because pitchers uh, it's hard enough and you're gonna make plenty of mistakes as a pitcher and you're gonna need your defense. It's the worst thing you could ever do is turn around and show up your defense. The worst. They're there trying their best. Swing and a miss and Damon down on strike so the Yankees have not been able to click against Mahalam after that first inning no runs a hit and one man left we go to the fifth inning it's 3-3 at the stadium Hi everyone Bob Lorenz in RDS studios with the Nissan update don't forget we'll have full rocket coverage today on the post game and then tomorrow 1130 it's an all-new edition of Yankees on deck it's David Justice and Joe Girardi you know what it is? It's Emmy winning. It's lots of fun. It's a little something we like to call TV magic. Kind of like listening to Bobby, Al, and Michael K. Oh, would you stop? It's unbelievable. He doesn't have a game going on, Bobby, so he's he's, he's doing that on the he update. He looked for some of that candy you were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> 84 pitches for Clemens, and he had a rough fourth inning, 28 pitches. He struck out five, and this is the Rocket relaunch, his second tour of duty with the Yankees. Bautista leads off, and the pitch is high, 1-0. The Corona Extra scoreboard has a 3-3 tie, 3-5-1 and one Pirates, 3-5-0 and oh for the Yankees. You would assume, unless it's a very short inning, that this will be Clemens' final inning, because I don't think they're going to push him much past 100. Uh, we've been talking about how Roger looks like he's not really maxing out his effort. Yeah, you know, remember this is what it, it's his fourth start coming out. He had three starts in minor league starts, A ball, double A, triple A. This would put you in middle middle way through March. He did have the groin problem, which would have a lot of reason as to why he's not pushing off the backside as much as he normally would. Well, let's take a look at the five strikeouts that he's had out. 
Well, it, let's see right here. He's, he showed a real good split finger. There it is. Down and away to Jason Bay. Very good hitter. Xavier Nady. I think both of those guys are their best hitters. Ronnie Polino, another split finger. Here's a painted fastball away on Adam LaRoche. Another split finger. So, to, you know, what to expect, what not to expect. You know, he's, he's got to be careful to not aggravate his groin. I won't say he's pitching gingerly, but definitely has to be conscious of, uh, of his groin. And locate his pitches. There's been a lot of questions about how is Roger going to translate from the National League where he had a 2-3 ERA or 2-4 ERA over the last three seasons now to the American League that has the DH and he catches a little bit of a break because his first two starts are National against League National League teams. Uh, obviously this one against the Pirates and uh, then you've got his next start is going to be against the Mets and he's going to have five days rest rather than four. Then it's uh, June 21st. He has another five day rest. And that's going to be against Colorado. And then June 27th with five days rest against Baltimore. So his first four starts, he has extra rest, and three of them are against National League teams. And I think it's fitting here starting at, at Yankee Stadium, him giving himself that extra time, not pitching in Chicago. This Pittsburgh Pirate team is, is, is not a, a great team by any stretch. Although as we talk about that Freddie Sanchez is who's batting right now is the National League batting title leader last year at 344 the Pirates do have some some good hitters and some good players but as a collective unit they're just uh, not quite there yet. Now also with Clemens you, know, you worry about his age how is he going to finish a season well, because he's starting later he should have more in the tank toward the end of the season and his numbers last year would indicate that's the case chopper to third a rod now last year he started June 22nd today obviously is June 9th but in the second half of the season last year he had an ERA of 2.18 and in September he had an ERA of 2.33 so he did not tire and he, he keeps the ball in the ballpark last year he gave up just seven home runs three of them with runners on and only one of them with a two strike count. So he knows how to pitch. Not only does he have good stuff, but he now has the wisdom of 24 years on the mound. And there's a strike. Well, he pitches to the hitter, and he also pitches to the situation. Uh, he knows who, um, who, can, who the best hitters are in the lineup, and he knows when those situations come up what he, what he needs to do. What he, you know, when you get in your 2 and 0, oh, your hitters count 3 and 1, uh, it could be the split finger to one guy and a fastball to another guy. And the one one high fly ball deep left but it's in the park Matsui battling the sun getting an angle and he makes the play for the final out of the inning. You can see the sun glinting off his glasses which are on top of his hat not on his eyes but he was battling angling getting away from the sun and making the play a one two three inning we are halfway through at the end of four and a half at the stadium it's a three three game on yes hey Yankee fans get another chance to see all the big hits and great plays another time around with WB Mason presents Yankees encore later after each game and again the next morning at nine only on yes Derek Jeter will lead off the bottom of the fifth inning. Yankees and the Pirates are tied at three, and there's some movement in the Yankee bullpen. Nobody's throwing just yet, but they could be momentarily. And the pitch outside, 1-0. and On the Corona Extra scoreboard, it's 3-5-1 and one for the Pirates and 3-5-0 and oh for the Yanks. into this game Paul Mahalam the Pirates pitcher statistics wise isn't doing well obviously a two and eight five three five but he's changing speeds enough to get the Yankee hitters a little bit off their timing there you see a 2 0 change up like last night Tom Gorzolani who pitched I thought very well six and third innings last night four runs Gorzolani I thought had a little better stuff velocity wise 
Holland is, is changing at speeds enough effectively to get the timing disrupted on his Yankee hitter so far. I think you see it more and more. First time a team faces a, a pitcher, it really takes a while. And the Yankees always seem to struggle the first time, that he, especially with youngsters. These guys are young, but they've been around a little bit, so they know how to pitch and really exploit the fact that the Yankees don't know them. The Yankees are much more comfortable with a great pitcher that they've seen a lot than a mediocre pitcher that they haven't seen at all. And that's been that way through the years. Even with a different team, it just seems like great hitters like to know what they're facing, like to know what to expect. And it's kind of a, a role reversal because when you haven't seen a young pitcher ever before, you know, it's uh, the second time through the lineup, the third time in the lineup, through the lineup, but actually, uh, Mahalam, since the first inning, he has gotten better, you know, from the second, third, and fourth inning. Now, Mahalam has faced the Yankees in spring training. Uh, that's like two innings at a time. But he's never faced them in a big league game. And it's foul back, still three and two on Jeter. Jeter doubled in the first inning, scored a run. Bobby Abreu is on deck. And Jeter works a leadoff walk. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the New York Yankees. It may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the aforementioned New York Yankees. Yankees could start the runner with a Bray with the plate, hit the ball the other way. And that one's fouled back. Probably missed that one. Like the bat. Big hole between first and second. I would be surprised if Bray was not looking for something that he can pull over there, even though that's not really his style, but take advantage of that real estate. That time showed Bunt the count one on one. Bobby was showing Bunt a lot when he was yes, struggling. Yes, he was. And uh, uh, that's a sure sign that you're not comfortable, that you don't have a lot of confidence in what you're supposed to be able to do when you are at the plate. Several times he would bunt him with men in scoring position. And he was the uh, third hitter in the lineup. And he takes it the other way through the left side for a base hit. So the Yankees have runners on first and second for Alex Rodriguez. And also extends a Braves hitting streak to nine straight. Well, he's got that. Uh, I asked uh, the hitting instructor long about uh, how Abreu, if he did this in Philadelphia, you know, he's got that tendency to pull off the ball. Uh, but that's just his natural style of hitting. But he kept his hands back. He pulls off a little bit, but he kept his hands back on that pitch there that was kind of out and away from him and uh, lined it uh, sharply in the left field. Nice piece of hitting. A-Rod, an RBI and a ground out in the first, his 57th rookie, then he walked and stole a base in the third. Now, Alex never got the chance to play with Roger Clemens. His first year here was Clemens' first year with the Astros. The only time they played together was on the World Baseball Classic United States team, and I was on that team as well. I know you talked glowingly about that team, Al, that it was a great experience. It was. It was, uh, well, I, I backed into it. I think nine guys got hurt, and I begged enough, so. so <laughs> <laughs> I know they could have had a handful of others, but it, it was an honor, and it was, it was special to be part of a, a room and a team as, as great of the players that were assembled for the Team USA. 
the 2 0. Must have been a lot of tension in that room, huh? <laughs> Uh, veteran players that are stars and superstars. No, it was contrary. It, it was what an enjoyable experience. And Buck Martinez was the manager. I think of Rogers last game. He pitched a stellar performance in Anaheim, which was the quarterfinal. We we beat Mexico. We go on to uh, to the finals. And uh, I think he went seven innings, one run. And I don't know who was pitching for the Mexican team, but Team USA didn't get any runs. Count three and one. As A Rod was taking. Jeter's on second, Abreu was at first. 3 3 game, bottom of the fifth inning here at Yankee Stadium. It comes a big pitch of this game right now at 3 1 count, two men out, two men on, nobody out. And A Rod walks. So a walk, a single, and a walk, and the Yankees have the bases loaded and nobody out. Jim Colburn will come out and talk with Mahalam and the Yankees have the batter up that they want up with the bases loaded. Why? Because Jorge Posada this year has eight hits in 11 at bats with the bases loaded. Pretty good number. Even his style, uh, Posada's style of taking batting practice now is, uh, is a little bit different from what he had done in the past because uh, but Posada is so comfortable and confident in everything that he's doing, you know, and, and, and Jeter and Posada kind of, you know, you have a little fun when you're taking batting practice. And Jeter would say, well, uh, hit one, hit one to right to the right side, hit one to the left side, uh, hit one in the air, hit one on the ground. So, you know, you just, well, it's really a, a wonderful feeling when you're confident in yourself to be able to go to the plate and know that you're going to be able to hit the ha ball hard someplace. And historically, Jorge Posada has always been a great fastball hitter. The scout report was you throw many big breaking balls and changeups. He wasn't as good on. This year, the numbers are, are almost flipped. He's batting nearly 400 on off-speed pitches, really staying back and letting the ball track deep in the zone. We saw Tony Armas beginning to throw in the Pirate bullpen. Now Posada hitting 360. There's Tony, and uh, that's second in the American League. Maglio Ordonez. Driven the other way, giving chase is Domit. He'll make the catch. Tagging is Jeter, and he will score. Sack fly for Posada, and the Yankees take a four to three lead. I think Ryan Dolman did all he could do, but the speed of Derek Jeter helped with that right there. So Derek having a little stutter step in that sprint home. You know what else is unusual, and we commented on it before. Polino just stands there blocking the play without the ball. Yeah, well, he's he kind of like had to decide what to do. Well, I mean, uh, Polino right at the last bit, he stuck his left foot mm -hmm. out there yep. too. Good way for a catcher to get hurt. Good way for a runner to get hurt. Oh, the runner for sure. Yankees up four to three. Here's Matsui, and there's a strike. Standing right on the plate. And watch his left foot right there. Some might say that's not clean, especially if you don't have the ball. Unwritten rule. We've heard about that recently. Mike Soshi used to do that all the time, didn't he? They all do it. <laughs> Nothing uh, unclean about that. Nope. Polito's a guy that'll stand on the plate if you want and knock him into the dugout. Go ahead. Yeah. There's a strike. Mike Sosha was one of the best at blocking the plates. Uh, Brian Bruni. 
By the way, the Yankees roster move in order to get Clemens on the 25 man was they sent down Chris Britton to Scranton Wilkesbury, their triple A team, and to make room for him on the 40 man roster, they moved Phil Hughes from the 15 day disabled list to the 60. So when you're on the 60, they can move you off the 40 without risking losing you. Hughes was nursing that hamstring problem and turned an ankle, so uh, his arrival date is still very much in the future. Yeah, that's not good news when you move you when they move you to the 60 day. And uh, well, I tell you what a setback it is for not only Phil Hughes but the Yankees. I mean, this this young man is is uh, sitting right on the brink of becoming something very special here. I did that game down in Texas when he was pitching the no hitter and he pulled his hamstring and I, I, if he hadn't pulled his hamstring I'm almost positive the stuff that he had that night and the command that he have had on all of his pitches he was going to pitch a no hitter. Well it does set him back a whole year of experience. Yeah. And he had built up to that you know mm -hmm. each time he had he was getting better and he had built up to that and then. Now you got to start all over again. 2-2. Two, two. Foul that. Now the one way that it could be a positive is if he does get back in August. You know there was some concern that the Yankees had to call him up earlier than they wanted to because of all the injuries and that he was going to surpass the innings total that they had wanted for him. Now that's not going to be a problem at all. So if he comes back in August, the middle of middle of August, he could just pitch as hard and go as long as he needs to go and, and not worry about reaching any new plateau pitch wise. And also give him a couple months with Clemens. The 2-2. Matsui hanging in there. But you also got to look at it this way. Uh, he had built himself up, uh, you know, to where he was really a competitor and uh, maybe going to be a, a big part of this scene here. And it takes a while even if you come back in August to be able to do that and by the time uh, he, he gets that momentum going again maybe it's going to be the end of the year. Pirates recognizing Bobby Abreu is getting a pretty good secondary lead at second base and very important obviously a base hit on the ground to the outfield if the runner at second base gets a good secondary lead it's much easier for Larry Bo to wave him home. Two two. That could be two but it's bobbled by Wilson and the out has made it second. A rod went in hard. But the force just made as Abreu moves to third and Matsui reaches on the field of choice. Besides this ball being hit hard, I think Abreu kind of blocked out Jack Wilson a little bit at uh, shortstop. And he was able to knock it down and still make the play at second base. But you can see that Abreu, I think, had a little bit to do with that, too, uh, trying to block him out. And he just never got the glove, uh, the ball in the glove. Here's Cano. Runners on first and third. And the count is one and zero. Oh. What that does is that this gives you another out in the inning. Uh, that should have been a double play and. And the Pirates should have been out of this inning, but now Cano still gets to hit with two men on. Mahalam at 96 pitches. Yankees looking to snare their fifth win in a row. Popped up and out of play on the left side. <laughs> Cano scored the winning run in the 10th inning yesterday. 5-4 Yankee victory on a dribbler to the right side by Jeter. An infield single, a walk-off infield single. The 1-1. Slice the other way foul.
Tony Armas Jr. is ready. And the one two. Over the head of Cano. Uh, just a breaking ball that kind of slipped out of uh, Mahalam's hand and. You'll see it right there. He just got underneath it. Well, Probably Mah able to duck underneath it. Mahalam knows that with Josh Phelps on deck and Armas ready that this will be his last batter. Whether he gets him out or not I believe at 100 pitches. He's kind of labored a little bit. He's about done. This will be pitch number 100. And it's driven out to fairly deep center. Chris Duffy is there. He'll put it away for the final out of the fifth. But the Yankees take the lead. One run, one hit, and two men left. Five in the books, 4-3 Yankees. His fourth try for his 300th victory, this one against the St. Louis Cardinals. Also in this game, he picked up his 4,000th strikeout and then had a sit and watch as Mariano Rivera closed it out. And got Miguel Cairo for the final out. Clemens receiving a huge ovation from the crowd. And since that time, he has gone on to win 48 more games. So he's in line now to win his 349th as he comes out to start the sixth. Adam LaRoche will lead off. Pitch is high, 1 0. 3 5 and 1 Pirates for 6 0 Yankees. LaRoche drove in a run in the first thing against Clemens. Foul bat, one and one. Adam LaRoche, uh, the son of uh, Dale LaRoche, who used to pitch for the Yankees. Better known uh, as the uh, La La that uh, Dave came up with to try to get hitters out back in his day. Adam hit 32 home runs last year. Ground ball to second. They made a big trade uh, bringing Adam LaRoche over here. They wanted somebody to try to back up uh, Jason Bay in this lineup. But he's gotten off to a real slow start. The designated hitter, Xavier 99 pitches for Clemens. 62 strikes, 30 through two balls. If you keep him score at home, there's been a scoring change. First inning for the Pirates, instead of giving an error to Jason Bay on the throw, give an error to Paulino, mishandling the throw. So it's an E2 when Posada had that RBI single to left field, not an E7. They just changed that. The 1 And the count 0 and 2. Along with Bobby Mercer and Al Leiter, I'm Michael Kay. You're watching Yankees baseball right here on Yes. We thank you for spending part of your Saturday afternoon with us. Roger Clemens, second go around with the Yankees. His first start today, and he's in line for a victory. He has not been outstanding, but certainly has been representative on the mound as the Yankees lead 4 3. And it seems like he's getting better as the game moves on, so that is strikeout number six for Clemens. Well, what Roger is doing today is, even though um, I, I don't know if you expect him to have the greatest stuff in the world his first time out, but he has uh, gave the Yankees a chance to win. I mean, that's what you. That's all you ask for from your starting staff, staff anyway, is just to give yourself a chance to win. Well, that pitch right there has been his best pitch of the day. He's been throwing a very good split finger fastballs. Nady couldn't get down low enough on top of that ball. Here's Ryan Domit. He doubled to right and then struck out. And there's a strike. That's been his fastball today, 89-90. But the splitter has certainly offset a little bit lower velocity. And a 1-1. And the Roger knows that the importance of getting ahead of the 23 batters he's faced so far, 12 first pitch strikes of those result, 10 of them resulting in outs. So what pitchers are supposed to do, get ahead and Put hitters on the defensive, and with that split finger, it's making these pirate hitters not look like major league hitters. And the count is level at two and two. 
I heard what Joe said before the game. He said, I'm going to let Roger dictate uh, what he wants to do. I mean, he knows himself better than we do at this point. He foul tips the ball to stay alive. Big cut by Domit. We saw Roger shake off Jorge a couple times to get back to that split finger, which was the right pitch. But when there's a pitch that you're just going to the well and, and a hitter doesn't look good, Ryan Doman, his previous at bat against Roger, saw three split fingers, swung through every single one of them. You see a weakness in a hitter, you go, you keep going to it. Let him prove that he can hit it. The 2-2. Got him. Strikeout number seven for Clemens, and he retires the last seven in a row. After the RBI, two RBI double by Wilson. Mr. Splitty was his big pitch tonight. Yankees like it, the crowd loves it, giving him a standing ovation as he walks off the mound. That'll probably do it. It's a quality start. Six innings, three runs. Yankees lead four to three. We go to the bottom of the sixth inning. Crowd cheering for a while as Clemens greeted his teammates in the dugout. A long talk with Posada, and his day is likely done. Mahalam still in there as Phelps swings and misses. And this is Clemens entering the dugout after striking out Domit. And Clemens looked sharper in his final two innings than he did at any point in the game, retiring the last seven Pirates in a row. And especially with his split finger, I think his split finger got uh, really good the last uh, three innings that he pitched. Now that was an interesting K corner up there. Was that defeating Father Time? Ground ball of third, Bautista. And there's one away. It looks like that's father time and uh, superimposed on a K. So, 44 years old, timeless. Get it. Now it's all coming together. Rocket. Now let's put a bow on this, Al. This has been the story of the day. Give me your review of what Clemens did today. Well, I think uh, six innings, five hits, three runs. Uh, that's, I wouldn't say more than what Joe Torrey and Ron Guidry wanted, but he pitched very well. He, it looked like he wasn't as aggressive pushing off the mound. Right groin, a little bit bothering him. Showed enough velocity, spotted the ball, and he had an excellent split finger. I would say this was an excellent performance. And this is the Rocket relaunch numbers. Six innings, five hits, three runs, two walks, seven strikeouts. He threw 108 pitches, his first start in the big leagues this year. The 2-0. Outside in the count three and zero to Melky Cabrera. I, I saw from Roger uh, today uh, uh, when he didn't have his good stuff, he pitched accordingly. But when he did have his good stuff and he had his his split finger uh, working, he spotted his fastball well and, and utilized his split finger to get the guys out. That's how you win seven Cy Youngs because you don't always have your good stuff every inning. And sometimes you don't have your good stuff when you start out. It may be uh, the the third inning that. Finally, things start to fall into place for you. But in order not to let those innings, other innings, to get away from you, uh, you just experience maturity and knowing how to pitch. You just you, you get by somehow by pitching accordingly. Well, after the walk to Cabrera, Jim Tracy has seen enough. Mahalo has thrown 107 pitches, so Tracy is going to go to the bullpen with Damon Jeter and Abreu coming up. Mahalo departs. He's trailing four to three. He leaves a runner on first base with one out. Another left hander making his way in. Yankees lead four to three. You come on back. The game summary presented by Sharp Aquos, the official HD TV of Major League Baseball. And this game today was about Roger Clemens, at least through the first six innings. The Yankees offense did its part. Putting four on the board. Clemens battled early, got stronger late, lasted six innings, gave up three runs, and here in the bottom of the sixth, the Yankees lead four to three and looking for more. As John Grabo, the left-hander, comes in to face Johnny Damon. Grabo on a relief of Mahalam. 
Runner was going. Hit and run was on, and Wilson cannot handle the ball. Now they give Damon a base hit. Well, the hit and run looked like it was on. And you can see that uh, Wilson was headed towards second base. He was the guy that was going to be covering with the runner coming from first to second. And he got out of position and lost his footing. And the ball gets by him. They will get a base hit out of this. Good call by the Yankees. Creates some movement. You got a pitcher on the mound that doesn't have strikeout stuff. Johnny Damon did exactly what he was supposed to. Ball away, hit the ball away. You saw Jack Wilson out of position because of the hit and run. Be aggressive, force the defense. There's Derek Jeter. Derek is one for two with a walk. And he has scored two runs. Still overcast here at the stadium. The lights have been on all day. And the count 2 and 0. Those are Graybo's numbers. This is his 22nd game. More than a hit per inning and too many walks. And the count two and one. Good speed on the bases for the Yankees. Cabrera at second, Damon at first. They're going. And the throw to third, not in time. Good play by Bautista. To keep the ball from going into left field. Nagy's being aggressive against Graybo and Paulino. Well, Melky Cabrera got a great jump. I don't know if that was uh, Melky just going on his own because of the looks that the pitcher wasn't doing. You see Johnny Damon making sure that Melky was going. Followed behind. It was a high pitch. Generally a, a good pitch for a catcher to come out of the shoot. Melky stole that off the pitcher. Down three and two. Now the infield is back. Yankees could get another run with a ground ball. Wind starting to whip up here at the stadium. And the flags now seem as if they're blowing straight in. But if you believe the Mattingly method, the knob of the bat over the flagpole is pointing out. So the wind is probably blowing out to left. It swirls. The uh, 3 2. Cheater walks and the bases are loaded. And here's the red hot Bobby Abreu, who has a nine game hitting streak and great numbers with the bases loaded in his career. Cabrera is at third. Damon is at second. And Jeter over at first. Well, how this inning is developing as a pitcher, when you know that you have base runners that can run as they were doing, and Melky and, and Johnny Damon hit and run, stealing bases, it just gives enough disruption for the hitter, to, the pitcher, not to focus on the hitter as much, and you get behind. Start rushing your delivery, you're getting bad counts, pitcher does. Hitters feast on that, and they should take advantage. I mean, the Yankees don't, uh, I mean, they've got some speed on, in their lineup, but you don't see them doing this uh, very often. And you're, you're right, Al. Uh, it certainly has uh, bothered Grayball because. Line drive right field. It is a base hit. Cabrera scores. Damon stops at third. The throw comes all the way into Paulino. Another base hit. Another RBI for Abreu. Yankees lead by the three.
Well, he gets behind, and then here you see that's a slider. It ends up being middle of the plate instead of going down and away. Grabo not realizing, recognizing he's got to get back into the count. You throw a pitch over the plate. Bobby Abreu, who is feeling better, you see that slider just spinning up there, middle inner half. Not a good pitch, or pitch lefty on lefty. And Jim Colbert wants to talk with John Grabo. Big batter in the game, Alex Rodriguez. There's no place to put him. And with one swing, he could open this game up. Absolutely. It's a perfect opportunity for the Yankees to blow it wide open here. Besides A-Rod, they also have uh, Posada. Alex with two grand slams this year. This one on April 7th, a ninth inning walk-off. And this one this Thursday in Chicago, not a walk-off. Yankees batting in the top of the ninth. And that broke open that game. So Alex has 22 home runs and 57 runs batted in. Amos throwing again. Look at the numbers with the bases loaded. 15 grannies and a 349 average. Fly ball right field. Tagging Damon. Catch is made by Gomit. The throw is cut off. It's a sack fly for Alex Rodriguez and the Yankees lead six to three. Fifty-eighth ribby for A Rod, second one today. Well, A-Rod did, uh, did the job, but the man on third, less than two outs. May not have been the, uh, the type of swing or the type of place he wanted to hit the ball, but it got the man in from third, and that's the most important thing. Well, this, this inning is winning baseball inning. It's a one-out walk for, for Cabrera. Johnny Damon executes a hit and run. Walk by Jeter. Here's Posada, two ribbies for him today. One for two and a sack fly. So the Yankees up six to three. Joe Torre, who has moved from his longtime perch on the bench to now leaning against the lowest step in the dugout. Runners go again, and another double steal for the Yankees. And Al mentioned this yesterday when we started the series. Paulino throws out 43 percent of base runners but the Yankees are running on him. Well look at the jump here. It, it, Jeter's getting an outstanding jump and I don't know whether this again this is all has to do with scouting you know scouting knows everything about every nuance of what pitchers are doing and hitters are doing. He Grabo that is he he may have like one look where he looks back one time or looks twice or doesn't look and there's certain nuances that pitchers do not change and if they recognize that they're going. Now they will intentionally walk Posada. He already has a 2 and 0. Oh. So that walk will load the bases and that's lefty Grabo up against lefty Matsui. And again, the Yankees have another opportunity to bust this open. 6-3 right now. And the bullpen will pitch the final three innings. Matsui today is 0 for 2 with a walk. Reached on a fielder's choice as well. strike from Grabo. Yeah, I always felt that if, there, if offense did enough disruptive things, bunting, walking, hit and run, sack flies, it created a situation where you just didn't feel comfortable and it gave the opposing team an opportunity to really break it open. The 0-1. Broken back. Pump back line drive on one hop to Sanchez and that'll do it here in the six. But the Yankees get two big runs on two hits. They leave the bases loaded. We played six at six three Yankees.
Roger Clemens went six innings, and this is the way he left, striking out Ryan Domit and then leaving to the strains of Rocket Man. And a congratulatory slap by the captain, Derek Jeter. Six innings, five hits, three runs, struck out seven. And Clemens is in line to pick up his 349th win. But the Yankee bullpen must do its job as Brian Bruni comes on in relief of Roger Clemens. Pitch is high. One other defensive change. Miguel Cairo takes over at first for Josh Phelps. You see Bruni's numbers. They're impressive. 19 hits in 27 innings and 24 strikeouts. And there's Cairo. Deep drive, left center field, giving Chase Cabrera on the run, on the track, at the wall, makes the play. Takes an extra base hit away from Ronnie Paulino. You know, what a difference today makes. Uh, it was uh, Melky Cabrera last night who misplayed the ball and inside the park home run, it turned into a two-run home run. And a beautiful play there. He tracking this ball all the way with his sunglasses down, with the wind blowing, and nice play, Melky. I can't tell if that ball would have been over the wall. I don't think so. I think it's close. just about an inch or two short. Well, he took away an extra base hit for sure, and the pitch to Jack Wilson is a strike. Maybe this gives you a better read. I don't know, Bob. I think yeah, he might maybe, be right. Maybe, top of the wall, maybe? Maybe top of the wall. I'll give you that. Very close. And there's a strike. Fouled away. Now on June 6th of 06, this was the catch by Melky Cabrera playing left field, taking a home run away from Manny Ramirez. That was definitely, that definitely was over the wall. <laughs> Another try for Melky. This time he has to come in. And there's two away. Try behind him, try in front of him. Well, Melky's uh, got one of the better arms, if not the best arm of the outfield uh, right now. And he certainly got speed, and, and he's tracking the ball. And one of the positions that uh, they didn't have a lot of confidence uh, in putting Melky in, that was in center field. But he has played the heck out of center field since he's been out there. Taking over for Johnny Damon, who's now become the designated hitter. Duffy fouls it back. You know, the one thing you, you, you want out of a center fielder, you want a center fielder who's got speed, obviously, and you want a center fielder who tracks the ball off the bat. And uh, the first step jump is uh, the biggest jump that you can get in the outfield. How many times you see an outfielder uh, chasing after a ball and he's about a half a step short? And that's just because he never got, a, got going uh, when the ball hit the bat. Being able to read that is uh, is quite efficient and, and good for a center fielder if you're going to get a good one out there. Paul Blair, I think, was one of the best center fielders that I've seen to play as shallow as he played and to track the ball down in the, in, in the gaps and also a deep center. Well, Andrew Jones does it pretty well down in Atlanta for many years, saving so many runs for those pitchers. Jim Cott used to always say that he wanted his outfielders to play as shallow as possible, and if the ball goes over your head, it's my fault. Well, here's the theory. Uh, the theory is, as we take another look at uh, Melky making that fine catch there off of uh, Polino's bat, uh, Ralph Houck used to tell me, the skipper for the Yankees, used to tell me, he said, look, you think about it, uh, how many balls fall in front of you, and how many balls are hit over your head? Most of the time, the ball, if it's hit over your head in center field or in the outfield, it's either up against the wall or it's going to be out of the ballpark. So he said the more shallow you can play 
the more balls you're going to catch. Boy, that's real fr frustrating for uh, Bruni and the Yankees. You get a two out walk. Seventh inning, that's a no no, especially to a nine hole hitter. Certainly not what Brian tried to do, but he got ahead 0 2, and then he kept elevating and overthrowing with that high fastball. There is one bit of uh, area that Bruni needs to improve a little bit on is that uh, 16 walks, now 17 walks in 27 innings. Count 1 0. Oh. When you have the velocity that Brian Bruni has, you have the tendency to overthrow. You know that you possess a 95 to 100 mile an hour fastball. And instead of recognizing to stay back and 92, 93 down in the zone, outside part of the plate is, is as effective or more effective than an overthrown 95 mile an hour fastball. Hey, if you get a chance, stop by and visit our friends at JR Music and Computer World. And what do you think Gidry's telling them there? Just slow down. Slow you, down? Yeah. You're, you're, you're a little geeked up and you, you got a lot of energy you got good stuff stay back it allow your arm to get on top finish through the zone reach out what does reach out mean? reach out mean make sure that your arm the arc of your arm gets up in position to throw and then reach out in front of you get the ball out in front of your head and reach your hand to the target throw your hand to the target extend maybe mm -hmm. runner goes Pitch is high. Throw to second. Not in time. Stolen base for Duffy. Duffy now is 11th stolen base in 13 attempts this year. Last year he was 26 and 27. Well, last night he hit the uh, inside the Parker. And Duffy is uh, definitely one of the fastest runners on this team. Not much of a chance for Jorge. Nine, and, and, and excuse me, yeah, I'll go ahead. Well, I'm saying nine out of ten times, good base runners steal it off the pitcher, not the catcher. And a team that doesn't run that much, and and Duffy's off uh, at second base, uh, being down three runs here in the top of the seventh inning with two men out. I don't know. Along with Bobby Mercer and Al Leiter, I'm Michael Kay. You're watching Yankees baseball on Yes. Six-three Yankees lead, top of the seventh inning. Yankees looking for their fifth straight win. And Bautista walks, so two straight, two out walks. And that brings up Freddie Sanchez, the National League defending batting titleist, has a tying run. He's not a home run hitter, but he is a hitter. And Scott Proctor gets up and starts throwing. Sanchez right there doing a little favor for Brian Brody who's having a tough time getting the ball down that ball was high for a ball see Freddie Sanchez's number this year last year the National League batting title way out in front he's been throwing so hard then he drops that slider in there 0 and 2 it's a good call for Jorge when you, when you have a pitcher who's overthrown and he's high a lot of times a breaking ball or a change up something off speed will get the pitcher to get back into the rhythm that he needs. And the 0-2. He struck him out. Another slider. So two walks and Bruni comes back to strike out the National League batting titleist from last year. No runs, no hits, no errors, and two men left on base at the end of six and a half. It's time for the seventh inning stretch here at Yankee Stadium. Hi, everyone. Bob Lorenz back in our Yes Studios with the Price State Ford update. A couple games to keep an eye on today. The Mets and Tigers, Oliver Perez will have his hands full. Detroit batting 3-10 against lefties this season. Jeremy Bonnerman going for a sixth straight win against or for the Tigers. Meantime, Red Sox and D-backs later tonight. Boston, as we know, 10 and a half games up in the division on both the Yankees and the Blue Jays. It is Julian Tavares against Micah Owings in that one. And then, of course, a reminder that we will have full rocket coverage coming up on the postgame show. Now back to the Bronx.
Thank you, Robert. In the Bronx, bottom of the seventh inning, and the Yankees lead 6-3 over the Pirates. Obviously, the uh, story of this game was Roger Clemens coming back. He gave the Yankees six innings, three-run baseball, and the Pirates will go to their third pitcher. Mahalam started, Graybo, and now Tony Armas Jr. And you see those numbers, Michael, not very good. He was he was brought in to be one of the starters, and now here he is in the bullpen. But anytime you have 30 innings, 45 hits, you're not doing your job. You see that bloated 8 ERA. Sometimes when you get uh, exiled to the bullpen and you have opportunities to get some work in and feel comfortable, you get back into knowing what you need to do. Now you know that at one point you had to be highly thought of when you were in the deal that got the Red Sox Pedro Martinez. The Red Sox traded Carl Pavano and Tony Armas Jr. to the Expos for Pedro Martinez. So that's how highly thought of they were. And uh, obviously Pavano just had Tommy John surgery and uh, he's probably not ever going to pitch for the Yankees again. And that's right. Who's your daddy is right. And Pedro now coming back from shoulder surgery hoping to get back sometime in August for the Mets. Armas actually came out of the Yankee system and they traded him to the Red Sox to reacquire Mike Stanley. Count one and two on Cano. It'll be Cano, Cairo and Cabrera. The killer sees at the bottom of the order. Well have not been in the National League East and pitching against Tony Armas while with the Expos Tony. I could see why he was traded for Pedro Martinez. Excellent stuff. Threw the ball in the mid 90s consistently. Driven out to left center field. Could be trouble. On the run is Duffy. Can't make the play. And Cano will get himself a leadoff double. He's two for four. Well, I don't know where Jason Bay was on that play. I mean, he was circling that and uh, gave up from the moment the ball hit the bat. And it was up to Duffy to try to run it down, and he just was too far away. And you see Robinson Cano, when he's right, he stays on that ball that's sailing away from him. That looked like a little split finger. As Bobby mentioned, you see where Jason Bay went. He just allowed Duffy to see if he can get the ball. But Robinson Cano, when he stays on that ball, stays back long enough and doesn't try to shoot the ball to right field, he's got much better result. Let's see if the Yankees have Cairo Bunt add another run as they head into the final two innings. And he does square, and he bunts foul. Cairo took over at first base last inning, really the top of this inning. So this is his first at bat. He's played very well since the injury to Minkiewicz. He started at first base, been great defensively, picked up timely hits. That's Cano's 18th double of the year. That one's bunted straight up in the air. And a nice play by Paulino. So Cairo does not get the job done. You know, Cairo was so upset that he didn't lay down that first pitch. And anytime there's a residual mental effect after realizing you didn't do your job, you see the barrel of the bat that dipped below the hands. And anytime a, a bunter does that, it's most of the time it's a pop up just like that. A lot of times the pitcher if he knows that you're in the bunting situation that's what you're going to do they try to throw you up in the strike zone in the first place to try to get you to pop the ball up. Here's Melky Cabrera. Well last night that exactly uh, was what happened Matt caps the closer for the Pirates. Melky Cabrera was in a bunting situation after Cano let off with a double and he successfully bunted a high hard fastball from their closer. And the count one and one. And Cairo, who knows that's part of his job, very upset yeah. that he wasn't able to execute it. Oh. Count two and one. Well, that run may or may not play into it. Obviously, we'll see how this game plays out, but 
you know, those are the situations for a bench guy like Miguel Cairo has to be able to execute, as well as a Melky Cabrera or different situational hitters, because there will come a time, like last night, when Melky needed to put down the bunt. He did. And now it's up to your teammates to pick you up, because if they could score the run, then it's no harm, no foul. Okay, he didn't get the bunt down. But if that's a run that's not scored, and then the Yankees have trouble in the final two innings, then that really gets magnified. The 2 2. Foul away. It's all part of execution and small ball winning baseball kind of mentality. Not always going to get the three run homer, and when there's situations like this, you have to make sure that you execute. Fundamentals, I mean, that's uh, basically what the game is is executing your fundamentals at the right time and being successful. Work on the same fundamentals. I don't care how long you're in the game. Every time you go to spring training, you work on the same things that are fundamental plays the cutoffs, covering first. Going from first to third. And those are your winning teams. For the most part, those are your playoff teams and your championship teams. It sounds kind of basic, but that's right. And the 3 2. Foul back. You know, fundamentals are not showy. You know, they're not the long uh, home run that's a grand slam. I mean, they're just they're just plays that that are consistent, you know, and and being consistent uh, as a professional athlete, that's what you try to achieve. And I think we're moving away from that in professional sports because a bunt or a free throw doesn't get you on sports center. That's the right. fundamentals aren't flashy, as you said. Line drive, base hit to left field. Jason Bay fields. They're gonna hold Cano right there. And a bad throw gets past everybody, and here comes Cano. He will score, and Cabrera advances the third. Yankees lead seven to three. Talking about fundamentals, the Pirates have been awful in these two games. Well, I don't know what Jason Bay was thinking early in the game. He lollipopped the ball in and overthrew the third base cutoff, and here he just airmails it. Good aggressive running on Melky Cabrera. He sees that he misses the cutoff, man. Anytime the outfielder misses the cutoff, man, you run to second base, and that just was so high that Polino, the catcher, couldn't even get it. He's watching. He sees it's an overthrow of the third base cutoff. And now with all of this room at Yankee Stadium easily, Melky gets into third base. Jason Bay is having a hard time figuring out left field here at Yankee Stadium. That scored a single. Obviously, there's no RBI. And the error is to the left fielder, Bay. And it's the second error for the Pirates. Infield in with Damon at the plate. Count on two. Johnny is two for four with two runs scored today. With the infield in, Major League average goes up 100 points. Johnny trying to take advantage of this. The 0 2. Paulino. Pump fakes Cabrera back to third. Yankees up seven to three. We're in the bottom of the seventh inning. The one two. The upstairs two and two. Count full at three and two on deck is Derek Jeter. Jeter has one hit and two at bats with two walks. Also scored two runs. Sort of looks like that uh, Damon's left handed hitter that Armas is kind of doing one of those unintentional intentional walks to Damon to get to Jeter but 
But uh, Jeter with the uh, runners in scor scoring position this year, he has been absolutely fantastic, and it's uh, not going to be any cakewalk. That's what he's trying to do. Well, I, I think the situation with Tony Armas Jr. is uh, when you're struggling as badly he, as he has this year, and he's actually made 158 consecutive starts before making his uh, first relief appearance on May 22nd. It becomes more of uh, just making pitches and hoping to get somebody out. Ground ball fielded there by LaRose. He comes home, not in time. And he didn't step on the bag to make matters worse. And the Yankees up eight to three. Well, LaRoche was a little nonchalant here, and Nucky Cabrera, I think he misjudged uh, his speed. You see, Johnny David had to get out of the way of the throw. He was running down the baseline, and and uh, LaRoche, uh, he had a little bit of a problem, maybe a, a second there, get the ball out of the glove, and that was the difference. Well, you said it, Bobby. You got to know your runners. You have a good runner at third base. It's a it's a broken bat dribbler to your left. Three steps, you step on home on first base, you get it out at least. I can't tell you that uh, Jim Frazier can't be uh, he can't be happy with the way the play the, the Pirates are playing this afternoon. Very sloppy, unbelievable. Yeah. And you don't know are they overwhelmed by 56,000 people when they play in front of 19,000 plus a game? Uh, it's a major league game that they're just making silly mistakes. You know, just fundamental mistakes that uh, they have made this afternoon, which has allowed the Yankees to blow this game open now at eight to three. And and I I I've got a feeling that he's not going to be very happy when this game's over with. All he has to do is move his left foot well, and step on the more, bag. Well, he was more interested in getting the runner at home. He had no and chance that was at his him. play to go at home, and uh, he just was a little bit late. I think he misjudged the runner and the speed. Jeter swings and misses. Well, not to pile on, but yeah, you know, the Pirates are a team that is a, is an organization that uh, has struggled in, in years, haven't made uh, 500 or postseason since 1992. Two years in a row, they had 67 wins. And if there's one thing, you got to make sure that your guys are fundamentally sound. Again, you can't get inside people's heads, Bobby, but I mean, you think they might be overwhelmed by the enormity of everything here? Being young kids? You know, I don't know. Possibly. I mean, they've got to be, uh, they, they, their adrenaline's got to be flowing a little bit more playing here at Yankee Stadium. Roger Clemens coming back. I mean, this is going to be a big day. This is a game that's going to be shown all over uh, all over the world and, and, and plays and Roger and, and uh, the Pirates at Yankee Stadium. But... I mean, this is a this is a capacity crowd. Now look at the ages of the starting lineup when Roger made his debut. Oh my goodness! Freddie Sanchez and Jack Wilson were the oldest at six. Now, I'd be a little intimidated about that. But <laughs> <laughs> my oh my! Damon goes ball fouled off. Who was the oldest? Uh, was uh, um, six years old. Who six was? years old. Freddie uh, Sanchez. Freddie Sanchez, Sanchez and Jack and Wilson were uh, both six. So they were just you getting were, out of kindergarten. You, you were still with your binky at that time, weren't you? That was 23. Yeah, I still <laughs> had my binky. Yeah. <laughs> That's a new word I've learned since my grandchildren no. come along. We used to call it pacifiers. You all know it. Now they're <laughs> binkies. This could be two. There's one. And there's two. But the Yankees get two insurance runs. Two runs on two hits. No errors. And nobody left on base. We played seven at the stadium. The Yankees lead the Pirates eight to three. Hey fans, today and throughout the Yankee season on Yes, we're allowing you to vote along with your Yankee announcers for the Chevrolet Player of the Game. Text your vote to 55222, or for more information, visit ChevyOffers.com. 
You can vote right up until the end of the game. Vote now and make your voice heard. Today's candidates are number one, Roger Clemens. Number two, Melky Cabrera. Number three, Bobby Abreu. And number four, Johnny Damon. Standard text messaging rates apply. Well, we go to the top of the eighth inning. New pitcher for the Yankees, Kyle Farnsworth. And he'll face Jason Bay, Adam LaRoche, and Xavier Nady. You see Farnsworth's numbers. Strikeout to walk ratio one to one. He's got better stuff than that. There's a strike. Farnsworth's stuff, pure stuff is nasty. I mean, a guy could throw 100 miles an hour. That's nasty. And, and a knee buckling slider, but he has not really uh, been consistent this year. His workload has been somewhat inconsistent and when he gets in there sometimes he has trouble throwing strikes. I think more than anything else and um, Al may want to chime in on this too but uh, Pirates worth control. He just doesn't have control. I mean I don't care how hard you throw the ball if you're pitching behind in the count all the time you, you can't be successful up here on the major league level. I mean you talked about his electrifying stuff. He's always trying to hit the outside corner the inside corner make a perfect pitch and he just doesn't have to and when he's doing that He's falling behind in the count from the from from his point of, uh, of purpose and puts the hitter on the offensive all the time. I think that's uh, Farnsworth's big if he ever can control uh, if he can ever re really get that control under harness and start pitching in front of these hitters. I uh, they're going to have they're going to have something pretty special down there to bullpen but he hasn't been able to do it. The ball just dropped from the upper deck. And it went right into a cup of beer that a woman's holding. How do you know that's beer? It looks like beer. Well, I mean, yeah, it's if, beer. If, if a ball goes and in the cup, <laughs> she's she gonna get foam anyway. With the ball in there. Oh my goodness. Pitches outside. It's your lager with leather. <laughs> <laughs> that's a gamer right there. That's, that's just a gamer. She got it in there. She will not take the ball out. She's gonna continue to drink it. <laughs> that shows me something. <laughs> oh yeah. The 2 2. High fly ball left field. Matsui's there. One away. Time for the in game box score for the Pirates, sponsored by Heineken. That's probably what she's drinking, so she didn't, she didn't want to waste it. Just five hits for the Pirates one for Bautista, LaRoche, Nady, Domit, and Wilson. And uh, Wilson drove in two runs with an RBI single. Check that a double. And the other ribby came off the bat of Adam LaRoche in the first inning off Clemens. And here is LaRoche. Fouls with that. It's still in the cup. She refuses to take it out of the cup. Showing it to everybody. <laughs> I want to take that uh, that soggy leather out of the cup and have to carry it around in your pocket. I'm wondering if she knows that it's rubbed in mud and she's still drinking the beer. And isn't Farnsworth, doesn't he really lick his hand? Constantly. Let's watch. Constantly. When he walks up the mound, it's not just like the tips of the fingers. It's from the palm to the tip of the fingers. Maybe she's a Farnsworth fan. Not healthy, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to check. Now he'll do it. Let's see. That's it. There we go. Two one count on LaRoche. And the pitch. Outside three and one. What I'm talking about, you know, it's a three one count, the two oh count. And uh, he finds himself in that uh, situation most of the time. And, uh, you know, that's a fastball situation. And the hitter is on the offensive. That was 95 miles an hour, and uh, even though it was up in strike zone a little bit, he got pretty good wood on it. Well, as great as it is for a pitcher to have superior stuff, and Farnsworth has that. Kyle throws 95 to 100 miles an hour. It works as a detriment if you can't keep it in the zone and utilize your off-speed pitch because it's difficult for hitters to hit 96. So they're a little more patient, and if you're erratic, and you're not hitting your spot. Sometimes even if you're in the zone, you're erratic in the zone. You're missing, you know, Jorge sets up inside, it's a strike outside. You're setting up outside, it's a strike middle. 
you know that's even equally as uh, as uh, hurting if if you're not hitting your spots. But I hear what you're saying, Bobby. Any pitcher, the major league level, you have to show. And Roger showed it today. He wasn't throwing 95, but you know, being able to throw your off-speed pitches for called strikes, not swinging strikes, because now you become less predictable. And I think that's what happened with Scott Proctor a couple years now as a major league pitcher. He's shown that he can throw a two-seamer for strikes. He's got a good curveball. He throws for called strikes, not swinging strikes. And when you do that, you possess the fastball that Kyle Farnsworth has. You're going to be unhittable. And all that, it's not easy to do. Well, if you're not unable to do it with, uh, with your mile per hour, should you back off a little bit and then uh, sacrifice the, the speed for, for control? Well, then it comes to a consistent delivery. And does Kyle Farnsworth have that, the impeccable delivery to enable the command by trusting, I'm going to take something off my fastball, throw it. That was 93 right there. He, he took a little bit off, and you saw it moved a lot in on Nady. Now he paints down the way. So sometimes these guys don't have that ability to be able to take the ball, take some velocity off. I don't believe he's he's one of those guys unless he's really locked in. You don't trust it either. Your entire existence as a pitcher has been, wow, he's got great stuff. He throws 100 miles an hour. Yeah. And then to be told, hey, back off a little. Throw it easier. Rick Roden used to tell me that all the time. Mm -hmm. Take a little off. Take a little off. I'd say, take a little off. I'm going to throw it harder. Yeah. Line right at A-Rod, two away. Now, one thing, Al, that, that Joe Girardi has said about Farnsworth, because he's caught him in Chicago with the Cubs, he said he's most effective when he throws downhill. This was hit sharply right at A-Rod. Well, what now, does that mean? Well, that means being able to stay back over the rubber. For, for, for Farnsworth, as a right hand, you're going to stay back over the rubber, meaning on your right leg, allowing and enabling the arc of the ball to work on the backside to get up in position so that you can throw the ball out in front. We watched Roger Clemens today. He's as good as anybody's ever thrown the ball. He has consistent delivery. You have a consistent delivery, you're going to have a consistent release point. A consistent release point, you're going to know where you're going to throw the ball. Marion Rivera's done it like clockwork. He's a robot. Same delivery. It's not easy. Getting on top of the ball. Getting on top of the ball instead of pushing it. Because if you push it and you lead with your elbow and you're slightly dropping your arm a little bit, there's all, you're always going to be off just a little bit. Your hand's a little bit off to the right side. You're going to get too much tail. You get your hand on top of the ball, you hook it. Runner goes. And that one's popped up. Third base side, A-Rod near the dugout, and it's on the roof of the dugout. So exactly when, when he's not throwing downhill, Al, what's he doing? Well, there? look, you, you mentioned, Joe Girardi mentioned, if you're able to stay on the backside and get your arm in position before your body goes forward, right. you're going to be able to get on top and through the ball. Instead, if you're drifting, like a lot of pitchers do, especially pitchers that throw the ball hard, they're, they're generating a lot of energy. They get out in front, and now their hand's either to the side or in, on top of the ball. You get to the ball side, you're going to get this run. You get too far on top, you see the ball, it'll hook. And that's mostly when you hear, hear pitching coaches stay back, ride the rubber, get on top. And that's what Joe Girardi was talking about. 1-1. One, one. Foul back. It's a nice blue shirt you have on. Thank you. Nice tie, too. Yeah. He looks good, doesn't he, Bob? Where's your stage at? <laughs> Good to be young and handsome, isn't it? I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Have all your hair. And <laughs> <laughs> that hair's coming back, Bobby. It is coming back. I'd be surprised if I don't have a full head of hair next year. Swing wow. and a miss. And that was an off-speed pitch, and Domit down on strike. Boy. So a scoreless inning for Kyle Farnsworth. No runs, no hits, no errors, and one man left on base. Bottom of the eighth inning, Yankees eight and Pirates three. You know, I was talking about Farnsworth and delivery and stay back and all that. No, nobody does it better than then Roger watch him stay over the back side of the rubber he gets his arm out it's the arc you want to get your arm up in position before you move forward watch out in front he's throwing the ball out in front of his face that's good finish you throw your hand to the glove Roger Clement stays back look at him finish through the ball you're gonna keep the ball down in the zone pitchers get in trouble when they rush through the backside and they're throwing behind their head as opposed to in front of their face 
the, the arm never really catches up right to to uh, to your release so you're a little bit behind and that's where you end up uh, and I think that what you know they've heard us talk about well pitchers get tired you know and later on in the in the game well their lower body does not allow them to get their 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 arm in the proper position again because they're not throwing downhill they get they, they just get lazy yes and you know it's interesting you almost have to play against human nature out what you were explaining if you're tired and you want to generate more power you're going to go against the everything rush. that you should be doing you're, you're going to rush. rush and go yes. forward and that's going to you know just foul everything up there's a strike it's so true what Al is talking about here with the with the pitches for hitters too. Watch this a good shot. You see Roger getting through. Roger wasn't max max effort today. I don't know whether he was being a little ginger because of the groin, but you know that even also enables a pitcher to stay back, realizing getting on top, finishing. Anytime a pitcher's finishing the way Roger did today, you're going to get a lot of quality pitches down in the zone. Count two and two. Abreu, A-Rod, and Posada here against Armas. Yankees looking for their fifth win in a row. The 2-2. Two -two. Fouled away. Crowd of 54,296. And that's the Yankees' ninth sellout of the year. Another game tomorrow. Tyler Clippard against Sean Chacon. Count three and two. Wonder if Tyler's pinching himself. You know, kid sitting on a team with a lot of stars, watching Roger Clemens pitch. Drilled down the right field line and foul. He was like a caged polar bear in the. Uh, Yankees clubhouse today walking around sitting in his locker for about a minute or two get up walk around a little bit more and, you know all the media that was in there uh, Michael and obviously uh, waiting for Roger to to show his face and it's exciting being with the Yankees it's, it, it's always an event there's something going on and when there's something going on I mean it's it's not just uh, here in New York it's all over the world. That's the exciting thing about playing for the greatest uh, uh, sports franchise. You corralled them for a while, though. I saw you sitting talking yeah. for about 10 minutes, yeah. right? Yeah, I did. Be nice kid. I have not had a chance to meet him, uh, uh, so I wanted to go over and say hello to him and just see what he was uh, thinking, getting ready to pitch tomorrow. Get some nice things to say. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Rodriguez swings and misses. Alex has had not much of a contact day. He's 0 for 1, but he walked twice. Had a sacrifice flies driven in two runs. He's at 58 on the season now. And that got him. He gets hit a lot on that left elbow. That's why he has that pad there. So he is hit by a pitch. Runners on first and second. And nobody out. Let's take a look at the Yankees in-game box score sponsored by Heineken. There are 10 hits in there, two by Johnny Damon, two runs scored. Jeter with two runs scored. Abreu, two for four, nine-game hitting streak now for him. He picked up a ribby. A-Rod has walked twice, hit by a pitch, and also drove in two runs. Posada, two ribbies. And Robinson Cano, a ribby and a run scored as well. Melky Cabrera has scored two. So the only ones without a hit, A-Rod and Matsui. Here is Posada with two ribbies. He's got 41 on the season. Now we mentioned that Posada is second in the American League in hitting. And this stat really jumped out at me. The Yankees have not had a catcher finishing the top 10 in batting in the American League since Thurman Munson in 1978, and he finished at 297. And Posada's always been a pretty decent hitter, but never in the top 10. No, not one catcher since Thurman Munson in 78. The captain, number 15. The catcher of the American League last year that won the uh, yep. batting title, Joe Mauro from Minnesota. Uh, they, uh, a lot of people feel that uh, they just worn out. You know, by the time of the end of the season, they just can't sustain a, uh, uh, you know, a long, uh, 
uh, a streak of hitting. Well, it wasn't long ago where the catcher was uh, similar uh, value as a center fielder, shortstop, second baseman. You got him for de defense. It was special to have a catcher that actually hit. One, two. High fly ball, right field. Domitz there. He'll put it away. Tagging is Abreu. The throw goes all the way to third, but Bautista comes up to cut it off. And there's one away. Now, Al, you played with the Mets with a catcher who was a great hitter. A great hitter, Mike Piazza. Did you see the wear and tear of catching wear him down toward the end of the year hitting-wise? I, I think so, but I, I would have to say that Bobby Valentine, who managed most of the time there, he did enough things to keep Piazza fresh. And he wasn't just a good hitter in a lineup and a great hitter. He was the offense. Right. So, you know, it's different than here where Posada is a great hitter, but you have a lot of support that are also great hitters around you. You know, when Mike went, so did the Mets offense. And that's tough because a catcher really should catch maybe five games a week, and that means you're taking your best bat out of the lineup two times a week. It's tough. It's tough to keep him fresh. Well, Joe tries to do the same thing. I mean, Joe's been a catcher before in his career, and he knows uh, the wear and tear that 162 games will take, not only on your team, but also, you know, the, uh, sitting behind that plate, especially when we get into the latter part of June and July and August when it really gets hot. And these guys start to melt away. I used to joke with John Stearns, a catcher with the Mets for years. He made the All Star team twice for the Mets. And at the All Star break, he had zero home runs as an All Star. Both mm -hmm. times? Both times. Really? How'd the dude handle that when you said that? That's exactly right. Dude. <laughs> What's this? And look, All Star break, zero home runs, All Star? What is that? <laughs> but, you know, that that's what it was. It, you know, the diamond kind of center of the field was more about defense shortstop second center field catcher if you got anybody some offense that was bonus especially if they're a switch hitter and can hit from both sides and hit with power from both sides well there are two uh, switch hitters in uh, in the American League maybe in baseball uh, uh, Veritech with Boston and Posada with the Yankees First and third with one out. Arm is taking too much time, so Matsui steps out. Yankees lead eight to three. We're on the bottom of the eighth inning. One, two. Just missed. Would you rather have a catcher, Al, that could hit or be a great defensive catcher as a pitcher? Uh, do we have a lot of other offense? Yeah. No, I, I'll take the defensive catcher. Well, even a guy who hits 180. If he's a great catcher, great receiver, calls a good game, can throw runners out, stop a running game, I'll take that. Given the center field, Duffy is there. He'll make the catch. Tagging is Abreu. He'll score easily. It's a sack fly for Matsui, and the Yankees lead 9-3. Hey, Yankee fans, get another chance to see all the big hits and great plays another time around with W.B. Mason Presents Yankees Encore later after each game and again the next morning at 9, only on yes. Well, let me make the question harder then. You've got an okay offense. It was pretty nice having Piazza's bat in the lineup. Yeah? Yeah. He, he, would, he was one of those few players that could carry a team for weeks. And Mike didn't have a strong arm, so he, he really had, as a pitching staff, you really had to work hard doing a lot of things to keep the runners not going. Line drive, right field, a base hit. That'll move A-Rod to second. And for Kanoa's third hit of the day. You know, there's more things than just being able to spot behind home plate. I mean, it, it, it's the fact that uh, I think you go for offense. I mean, you go for defense first when you're looking for a catcher. You know, what kind of arm does he have? And... And how does he handle the pitching staff? And uh, has he got his head in the game? And that's the reason that uh, the catcher is involved in the whole field. He's involved in every play out there. And that's the reason you see when you look around baseball today and you look in the dugout, you see mostly former catchers that are there that are managing because uh, they've had to handle the pitching staff. They have to know what's going on. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things that go on with catchers. So. Uh, when you get one that's uh, that's special like Jorge Posada 
or, or Johnny Bench or uh, Mike Piazza. Now Piazza was never known to be a, a guy that uh, was going to be a great defensive catcher. Now this is a special it. moment for Chris Basak. Pinch running for Alex Rodriguez his first big league at really. And he just must be beside himself right now. Well, I was talking to Chris and congratulated him for his call up and he's from Chicago and he said it every day in Chicago his list was ridiculous with all family members and friends and <laughs> he's getting his family out for this homestand here in New York and let them experience Yankee Stadium. And he's a guy who really made this team although he's called up later in spring training he impressed Joe Torre and his coaching staff so much in spring training because he can play everywhere and he does a nice job and we talked about this before fundamentally sound he'll do everything he has to do he can move a runner he can run he, wherever he plays he's not going to embarrass you defensively. Been in the minor league since 2000. Those are the stories you like to see. You battle, you battle, you hang in there, and you finally make it. Soft ground ball is short. Wilson fields across the diamond, and uh, that will do it for the Yankees here in the eighth. But they score one run on one hit. No errors and two men left. Basak will play third base. Ninth inning, nine three Yanks. Here at Yes, our award-winning Yankees coverage doesn't end with the final pitch. Stay tuned for the Nissan Post game with Bob Lorenz to get a recap of all the key plays from this interleague showdown with the Pirates, as well as highlights from around the league. Plus, Kimberly Jones has the inside scoop from the clubhouse. The Nissan Post game, it's coverage that you won't get anywhere else. Immediately following the game, only on Yes. New pitcher for the Yankees, the fourth they will use today, Luis Vizcaino. Clemens went six, Bruni one, Farnsworth one, and Vizcaino, they hope, goes one. Vizcaino will face the bottom of the Pirate order. Vizcaino was so effective last year for the Diamondbacks, maybe he'll pitch better against the National League teams because he has really struggled early. And there's a strike. Paulino, the way he stands at home plate, and he stands up like he's the uh, Jolly Green Giant, you know, and he's just kind of planted himself there and said throw it in here big guy if you're if you're if you're man enough not a whole lot of stride uh, just kind of stands there and waits for the ball well the day started with the story being the relaunch of the rocket and Roger Clemens in his second tour of duty with the Yankees went six innings and gave up three runs when he left the game. The Yankees were up six to three. And then he turned it over to the bullpen. So a zero for Bruni in the seventh, a zero for Farnsworth in the eighth, and now Vizcaino. Clemens looking to pick up his 349th career victory. And his 61st after the age of 40. Al, how old are you? 41. So Roger's three years old and you starting to, you know, maybe get some thoughts about going out there and pitching? Kidding me? I'll it's, be your agent. It is <laughs> much harder than it looks sometimes, and I could I couldn't do it. Swing and a miss. Paulino down on strikes. Not even the slightest itch. Man, I, I started feeling it when I was 38. 38 was was my fall. <laughs> Maybe my whole career. <laughs> I'll only take 15%. Oh, how generous you are. <laughs> hey, it, especially sitting here talking about sliders and deliveries and release points. 
It's not easy. Easier to talk about it, is it? You saw that, yeah. You saw the draft of just the, a couple days ago and seeing all these young college high school guys dreaming to become the next major league player. Matter of fact, the Yankees 30th pick overall in the first round. Andrew Brackman. North Carolina State. Big, tall, 6'11". Wow. He's got the hopes, and the Yankees have the hopes for him to. Wilson with a fly ball to right. Abreu's there, and the Yankees are one out away from their fifth straight win. A lot more calm in that dugout of late. And the Yankees, if they win this game, will pull to within two games of 500. And you can't even think about making any moves, gaining ground on anybody until you get to 500. You get to 500 and you try to get five over. And then you try to get 10 over. But they've been struggling to get to 500, now just two away. Well, they've got a good chance to keep, keep this uh, winning streak alive. And they could wheel off a lot of uh, consecutive win streaks. So. Uh, They know what kind of team they have. They just got to start putting everything together, and it looks like that they're a lot closer now than they have been since the season. All the injuries and get the pitching staff kind of lined up the way they had drawn it up beforehand. Punched out to left field, a base hit for Chris Duffy as he keeps it alive for the Pirates. Well, because of the talent, and there's all stars all on this Yankee field, that it's really uh, premature for some of the folks to get all panicky and that guy right there his calm demeanor and his ability to just keep a lot of the exterior distractions out of that clubhouse and out of the minds of the players and you allow the players to realize what their job is so it's to execute whatever it is playing the field hitting pitching just do your job you keep clicking away and you have a talented ball club you're going to win games it's the panic mode that you see from hierarchy and coaching staffs that players feel that angst and that anxiety and uh, it's not good it's not a good environment Joe Torres as calm as anybody keeps the guys positive you got to get out of it fight your way out of it and the one thing that you've noticed with the Yankees especially in Chicago in the game yesterday when they fell behind the first couple of months of the season it looked like their body language was shot like they didn't think they had a chance now they've been battling back the attitude is a lot better they fall back. They still think they're going to score runs because they do have a great offense. And uh, it, it just seems like a different mindset on this team now. Maybe it's because they're getting better, better pitching. But for the first time all year, all parts are coming together. Pitching, defense, and offense. And sometimes they had a well-pitched game, they didn't score runs. <laughs> Other times they score runs, they, they didn't get a, a well-pitched game. So now it's coming together. And let's see if it can consistently come together. Now Tyler Clifford's turn tomorrow. He started this five-game winning streak. The 2 1. There's a strike, and the Pirates down to their final strike. This guy in deals right in on the hands, an emergency swing. The 2 2 stays alive, fouls it back to the screen. And the 2 2. He Struck him out, ball game over, and the Yankees win 9 to 3. In the ninth inning for the Pirates, no runs a hit and one man left. 
Nine, 11 and 0 Yankees, three, six and two Pirates, and Joe Torrey manages Roger Clemens for his second tour of duty and for Torrey's 2002nd career victory as a manager, and for Roger Clemens, his 349th career victory. So Clemens was steady, not spectacular by any stretch, but he did his job, and he gave them what qualifies as, as a quality start. And Major League Baseball counts that as a stat. That's six innings and three runs, and that's exactly what Clemens gave them. Pirates scored in the first. They scored two in the fourth. But when Clemens left the game, uh, the Yankees had a 6-3 to three lead. They built it to 9-3, and uh, they have won their fifth game in a row, starting with the Tuesday in Chicago. And also, they've now won their third series in a row. They beat the Red Sox two out of three. They beat the White Sox three out of four. Now they've taken the first two games of this Pirate series, so they have this one as well. So the Yankees win nine to three. And Kim Jones settling in front of the dugout, and looks like she got herself a pretty big starter interview. It's the Yankee captain, Derek Jeter. Kim? Thank you, Michael. Derek, does it seem like old times? Somewhat, yeah. You know, it's good to have Rocket back on the mound. Um, he did an outstanding job. It's exactly what we needed from him. I know you want to win every game, but you had that walk to lead off the fifth. How much did you want that go-ahead run for him? Well, he's pitching well. You know, I think he, uh, he struggled a little bit with his control. This is his first time out, and uh, we knew he had probably one more inning left in him, so we wanted to try to get him a win. What did you think of that reception as he walks off and then all of you in the dugout? It was great. I mean, uh, the fans have been great here throughout the years. They respect Rocket. You know, he's done a lot of things. He's accomplished a lot of things here, and, and hopefully he has a few more things left. I'll let you go after this, but you got to tell us what you said to him before the game that you were both had a laugh at. Well, I was introducing the infield to him. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Derek. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. That's right. He didn't know those guys. He never played with Cano, never played with A-Rod, and uh, obviously didn't know Josh Phelps either, so it was a new infield. No wonder they had a good laugh. That's right. So Derek loosened up the moment right there. If Roger felt any pressure. Uh, Derek diffused it right there. This is your new infield. When we come back, we'll give out the awards. We'll break it down. Then Bob and Kim with the postgame show. Yankees win 9-3. to three. Want to remind everybody that in our postgame show, we will carry Roger Clemens' press conference, and you'll hear from the Rocket himself about what he thought of his performance. Right now, let's take a look at the Geico play of the game. Call Geico and save 15% on your car insurance. And that play of the game came off the bat of uh, Ronnie Polino, and Melky Cabrera chasing it down in center field, and taking a whole road away from Polino with that nice catch up against the fence in center field. Our Geico play of the game. He's made a lot of them out there in left field, now in center. 9-11-0 for the Yanks. They win their fifth in a row. 3-6-2 and two for the Pirates. Clemens the win. Uh, Mahalam the loss. And a three-hour and 17-minute game. Clemens, six innings, five hits, three runs, two walks, and seven strikeouts. And for the Yankees, as I mentioned, a five-game winning streak. I wonder, oh, yes, I wonder who the Chevy player of the game is. Could it be Clemens? I don't know, there was some offensive production there as well. A lot of stars. We'll find that out. We'll have the postgame with Bob and Kim and hear from Roger himself coming up. He's win 9-3. Time to announce the Chevy player of the game is voted on by you, the fans, and the three of us here in the booth. Who is it? Mm, Roger Clemens, of course. He pitched very well of the 24 batters he faced. He was ahead 15 of them. Of those 15, he got 12 outs. He had a good fastball, good split finger, as you see that one there to Domit, Ryan Domit. He was on, and the Yankee hitters got the uh, run that was needed for him to get the win, and Roger Clemens is Chevy player of the game. Coming up on the Yes Network, stay tuned for the Nissan New York Yankees postgame show with Bob Lorenz and Kimberly Jones, featuring complete game analysis and interviews. The senior producer of the Yes Network and today's game produced by Kevin Smolin. Directed by John Wilson, pre- and post-game, produced by Drew Kaliski and directed by Michael Cooney. Supervising producer Woody Fryman and the executive producer of the Yes Network is Mr. John Filippelli. Join us again tomorrow for Yankees baseball as the Bombers take on the very same Pittsburgh Pirates right here at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. Coverage begins at noon with batting practice today, followed by the New York Yankees pregame in high definition where available. For more on the Yes Network, log on to yesnetwork.com. Once again, the final score of the New York Yankees 9 and the Pittsburgh Pirates 3. We'll be back from the booth with some final thoughts. That's in just a moment. But now, let's go to Bob Lorenz, who is standing by patiently in our studios. Bob? 
All right, Michael, thank you. Good to have you with us on the Nissan Post Game Show. Did you sense the Roger Clemens theme on that rollout right there? Well, it was all about the Rocket today as he picks up the win, and the Yankees get their fifth straight victory, 9-3. They haven't been on a winning streak like this since September of last year. They got something going. They won 8-10. Let's check the game highlights. They're brought to you by Chef's Diet. Visit them on the web at chefsdiet.com. And there's Roger making his season debut and heading out to Monument Park, getting a little mojo. Slim Babe. Top of the first, man on second. And Clemens trying to keep that runner from advancing further. He's facing Jason Bay. Oh, he throws him the splitter and he gets it. First strike out of the game for Rocket. Next man, Adam LaRoche. And a base hit to center field will score Jose Batista. The Pirates are on the board first against Roger Clemens. It's 1-0. Next man up, Xavier Nady. Nothing doing. Gets him on a fastball outside to end the inning. The bottom of the first, the Yankees already with a run in. Jorge Posada drills one to left field. Derek Jeter will come in to score. You see the bad throw right there. Kind of a... Yeah, just misses there. Posada would advance to second on that. So it's 2-1 Yankees. Now, still bottom of the first. Two men aboard for Robinson Cano. Sneaks one under the glove of Jack Wilson. And Posada comes in, part of a three-run first inning. And the Yankees are up 3-1. Now, top of the second, sometimes when you're a pitcher, you got to help yourself. That's what Roger does. Chris Duffy topping one to the left side. Roger barehands it, fires, and gets him at first. Still 3-1 at that point. On top of the fourth, Jack Wilson at the plate. And line drive out to right field. Bobby Abreu... Tracking it, but he can't come up with it. It bounces off the wall. Nady and Ronnie Paulino come in to score. That ties the game at three, but those two runs in that inning, the only other runs that Roger would give up. Bottom of the fifth, the Yankees get one back. Base is loaded for Posada. Lifts one out the right. Derek Jeter will tag and score. And now the Yankees are back in front four to three. And then the Rocket came out in the sixth inning and facing Adam LaRoche. Gets him to ground one to the right side. Robinson Cano will scoop and fire, and that's out number one of the sixth. And then facing Xavier Nady. Strikes him out with a splitter. And finally, Ryan Dumit, and he will finish with a flourish. The 2 2. Got him. Strikeout number seven for Clemens, and he retires the last seven in a row. So Clemens leaving with the big ovation after striking out seven in the ballgame and giving up just three runs over six innings. Bottom of the sixth, Yankees get some insurance. Bobby Abreu with the bases loaded. Through the right side, Melky's in, part of a two-run sixth. And then seventh inning, Brian Bruni in to relieve Clemens. Paulino blasting one to center, but Melky Cabrera races to the wall and makes a beautiful catch, leaping catch right there to take a potential extra base hits away from Paulino, maybe even a home run. Melky also went one for three, scored a couple runs, so it was that kind of afternoon. Everybody contributing for the Yankees in a 9-3 win. Johnny Damon right off the top, two for five. He scored a couple runs, as did Derek Jeter, who went one for three. Bobby Abreu went two for four. He continues his hot hitting, and Robinson Cano continues his scorching hitting as he went three for five. All the backup, Roger Clemens, as he gets a win in his first game back and notches career win, number 349. All right, I want to remind you that coming up tomorrow, 11.30 in the morning here on Yes, it's the latest edition of Yankees on, Jet, on Deck. Join David Justice and Joe Girardi for that. Again, it's tomorrow, 11.30 here on Yes. But stick around because we have a lot more coming up here. We're going to get thoughts on the Rocket and so much more from Michael, Bobby, and Al, and, of course, Kim Jones with the players and Joe Torres. Much more ahead on the Nissan Post game, so don't go away. The Yankees postgame show on Guess is brought to you by Nissan and your local Nissan dealer. Well, it was a day that began with Roger Clemens making his traditional trip to Monument Park. So much anticipation from the packed crowd at Yankee Stadium for Roger Clemens' relaunch in pinstripes. And then when the game began, well, Roger Clemens turned in some of his best work this season. But perhaps overall, as he picks up the win, and everybody happy that the Rocket is back and back on the winning track. Good to have you with us once again on the Nissan Post Game. It's time for the W.B. Mason Post Game Booth Report as we talk more about the Yankees' 9-3 win over the Pirates, and we will talk to Michael, Al, and Bobby about that. And Michael, I think you know we have to start obviously with uh, Chris Basak pinch running in the seventh inning. I, no, wait a minute. 
Hang on. No, we should start with Roger Clemens, I guess. All but, right. You know, let's, these numbers, Michael, six innings, five hits, three runs, seven strikeouts. They seem to me that that would be exactly what the Yankees expected of him. 108 pitches, maybe a little much, but beyond that, it was typical of what they expected, and they got a win out of him today. Well, I don't think, Bob, that they expect that of him in the future, but you're right. He only had three minor league starts, and uh, then he actually skipped the fourth one, which would have been on Monday. It would have been a major league start. I don't think anybody should paint this as an extraordinary outing for Roger Clemens. He did okay. He struggled in the first inning. He had a great splitter, and then he finished strong, Al, and that was the important thing. Last seven in a row, last batter he faced, great splitter struck him out. So it was a quality start. I think the Yankees expect more of him down the line, but that was pretty good for a first time. Boy, I don't know, Michael. A, a six-inning quality start, and to get the win, you saw the enthusiasm and excitement of the Yankee uh, hitters. Roger comes in after the, the top of the fifth, and he's, come on, let's go, guys, and, and, the, and the Yankee offense responds to it. So I'm not saying uh, that y y there's uh, an expectation of him throwing shutouts, but I, I think what he did today was beyond uh, what people would expect. And if he were to able to go six innings, three runs or less in the all of his starts, the Yankees would be thrilled. Now, last year and the last three years, Bobby, if he gives up three runs in six innings, he might not get a win. But if he does that each time out with the Yankees, he's going to pick up his share of W's. Well, he's certainly going to pick up his share of W's, you know, and a win's a win. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't care how you get it, a win's a win. And uh, I think that uh, if you ask Joe Torre and Ron Guidry if they'd take this uh, performance each and every time Roger Clemens goes after, I think they'd say, bring it on, baby. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one thing that I was really impressed with uh, Roger this afternoon was uh, the fact that uh, he got off to kind of a shaky start. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't uh, making the pitches like he thought he should be. But he, that's just, just to show you the kind of professional that he is, the kind of competitor he is, because, you know, he made some adjustments himself. And he was able to spot the situation, pitch to that situation, pitch to that hitter, pitch to that inning, pitch to that score, whatever it was, in order to keep uh, from just blowing totally up. And uh, that impresses me with Roger. And when you see a guy that's got seven Cy Young Awards, you can see how he has gotten those seven Cy Young Awards because he knows how to pitch. Now, let me ask you this, Al. The one thing that jumped out at you is that, you know, his fastball was 89, 90, maybe topped out at 91. I think he was 92 in the first inning. Is that a cause for concern, or do you think that that was a product of because he had that fatigue growing? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm curious and looking forward to the press conference and hear what he had to say because we were talking about how calm his delivery was. He really wasn't pushing off the rubber. And this has been something that has, uh, has not plagued him, but he's had some groin injury issues. So he really played along with what he had. And if there was some little residual effect to the groin, he was able to maintain it, have good delivery. He didn't have the overpowering fastball, but he's got a split finger. And at times it was nearly unhittable mm -hmm. guys let me ask you kind of expand on what Bobby was talking about Michael you mentioned it too that as the game went on he settled down and he got stronger now talk about the importance of that for Roger as he hit the 80 pitch mark Michael and the 90 pitch mark that he's actually getting stronger because in a way that mirrored some of his minor league starts his last two in fact when he got better as the game went on I was kind of surprised to even come see him come out for the sixth inning and that showed you that he felt okay and he started to feel even better maybe there were butterflies I know he's 44 I know about the seven Cy Youngs I know about the uh, you know number two in strikeouts and all that but he maybe had butterflies and he settled down but he certainly found his groove Bobby and the fact that he came out and pitched the sixth inning I think that's a good sign well he found his groove because his groove was with the split fingered fastball mm -hmm. I mean uh, maybe the fastball wasn't uh, the 95 mile an hour fastball that uh, we've been used to seeing from Roger Clemens but he found an out pitch and he utilized that out pitch to get these guys out and he spotted his fastball so uh, that just goes to show you that he knows how to pitch and you know and, and this is one of the things not only did it in energize the crowd here at Yankee Stadium and energize this ball club that's the first time I've seen them really energized you know in the dugout knowing that they've got a chance to win and Roger Clemens is here our pitching staff is finally falling into place and you know what we may reel off 10 15 wins in a row who knows you know what's interesting too Al is that when a pitcher goes to spring training they try to get him six starts just to build them up to 100 pitches sometimes even 90 pitches this guy had three starts and he threw 100 and some odd pitchers today that's also a positive sign well, it is a positive sign and, and look there was definitely an accelerated program for Roger to get back sooner the way the Yankees were going and and uh, you know there were that little period of time I think there was some instance that he probably should have gotten another start and you're exactly right the amount of starts that he has workload wise really would be the equivalent of being in the middle of spring training sometime in March so you know for what he was able to show today and do what he did and like what Bobby was saying he he figured out during the game what was working what I needed to do in the sense of having to use a split finger he threw some good sliders you know this guy's a veteran pro he's arguably the best pitcher that ever played in the major leagues 
you know, he's going to be a big, big asset, not only every fifth day, but what he means in that clubhouse. Guys, let's uh, expand this conversation beyond just Roger now. It's a great win overall today. Uh, let's talk about the things that are happening right now. Obviously, this team, and this is not a slight to Johnny Damon, but right now they are a better team defensively with Melky Cabrera in center field. We saw him make a great catch today, tracking another one down. This team seems to have, and is this fair to say, Michael, a different dynamic with Giambi out of the lineup, Johnny in as the DH, and Melky in center field. I don't think it's unfair to say that at all, and we touched on that in the ninth inning. This team just looks like it's going to win, and for the first two months of the season, it looked like it hoped that it was going to win. I don't think that there's a deficit that freaks them out anymore. They still think they could come back, and the fact that Cabrera is in center field and Damon has that weight off of his legs, so to speak, he's become a better hitter, John, uh, 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 Bobby, and then if he gets on base, he kind of ignites the whole offense. He's running the bases better. Yeah, he's hitting better. It seems like he's got an extra spring in his steps that he's had not had to play the outfield uh, day in and day out. I mean, when you're injured, and especially if you got your legs that are injured, and you rely on your legs like Johnny Damon does in center field, I mean, uh, it's working out uh, good for both uh, sides of it because Melky now could step in there. He's got a better arm in center field, and he's got the speed to run down those balls from center. Well, that's going to do it from the booth, Bob, and I'm just glad it's over because Leiter is crowding us over here. <laughs> He's, this guy's huge, and it's pushing me into Bobby. Bobby's going to go into the wall. It's yeah, going to be an ugly thing, don't so back to you. Don't knock me off my block, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Leiter's around. This you guy's watch so out. big. you got to watch out for those lats. They're all over the place. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's gigantic. It's unbelievable. All right, He's guys. He's got a lot of nerve. <laughs> <laughs> have, have a great muscles, night. Al. Now, I'm the fat one. <laughs> have a good night, take guys. It easy, we'll see you again tomorrow. All right, we're going to take a break. Coming up. We are going to talk about Roger Clemens, and we will hear from him. What an outing for Roger today as he picks up a win, his first back in pinstripes. And we're back once again here on the Nissan Post Game. The Yankees beating the Pirates today 9-3 for their fifth straight win. The relaunch of the Rocket, a success, and Yankees fans hope that will continue the team's upward trajectory. Roger today, look at the pitches, working that split finger so well, playing off the fastball that the guys in the booth noticed was only 90, 91 miles an hour. They hope that the, the fastball comes back a little more, which will help offset that splitter even more in terms of change of speed. But here's what Roger did today. Going six innings, allowing just three runs, struck out seven in a 108-pitch performance. He also had a pregame meeting at the mound with the captain, Derek Jeter, and Kim Jones had a chance to ask him about that. Roger, Derek Jeter just told me he introduced the infield to you right before you started. That gave you both a laugh. It did. I knew I saw him coming in, uh, so I knew something was, you know, something comical was going to uh, come out of his mouth. And uh, <laughs> he said, it seems like old times, but let me just familiar, you know, rise you with your new teammates. And he started going around the infield. And I said, hold up. And I said, I don't have number 46 on my back. That's, that's Pet. He doesn't know <laughs> who plays behind me. But uh, we did get a good laugh, and uh, then we got down to business. For all you've accomplished in your career, Roger, did you maybe need that to lighten the mood just for a second there? Uh, not really. I mean, okay. it's uh, just getting back. Um, you know, I wasn't allowed to come to the stadium yesterday, and, and uh, so I haven't seen these guys uh, that much. I've just been obviously checking them out on TV. So uh, when I went out to warm up, I took a look around at the stadium. Good crowd, and uh, the energy was up. And, you know, we feed off the energy. That's why we do what we do. And uh, uh, it was just a great day. The guys, you know, fired them runs up there, and uh, it was a good day. That splitter looked familiar. It did. It, it showed up again, and uh, I worked off that a little bit, worked off my fastball. Jorge did a great job. You know, we haven't worked in a while, but um, he got right back to our cadence, what we were working on, and uh, uh, it was a good game plan, and we tacked the zone, and, and now um, as each start hopefully goes by, my legs will get stronger, and I'll be able to get behind the ball a little bit more. You just mentioned Jorge. The two of you seemed to have a long conversation in the dugout when you were finished. What was that about? Uh, it was about our pitch selection on a couple guys, about where I was comfortable doing what I needed to do at that point. I think down the road, again, I'll probably get a little quicker. Uh, everything will get a little stronger, and um, and we'll go from there. But uh, there's some certain areas that I wanted to be comfortable in uh, and pitch to where I was comfortable, and, and he was right with me on that. We saw a lot of energy and intensity, not from the crowd alone, but from all of you. You yelled at mm -hmm. yourself a couple times. Do you think that maybe you'll feed off this team, and more importantly, maybe this team will feed off some of your energy? It's a good ball club. You know, like I said, I'm, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm here to help them, and uh, they're going to help me and make me shine, make me look good again like they did today. So uh, the talent is here. We all know that. And... Uh, you know, you just got to play with the chip on your shoulder. This is a this is a very talented ball club, and uh, you know, I'm just looking forward to getting things going now that I'm back to, to get in here with these guys and uh, 
and uh, have a good time. Last question for you. What was it like walking off to that reception and then all of your coaches and teammates in the dugout? It just felt great because, again, I've worked uh, real hard to get to this point. I did have one little setback with my legs, and uh, I was trying to get here as quick as I, I possibly could and uh, to join these guys. But the crowd, the noise in the, from the crowd, is uh, it was uh, overdue. It was missed. Thank you, Roger. Okay. All right, so there's Roger Clemens, obviously feeling, feeling very good about his first start. But let's find out what the skipper Joe Torre thinks as he talks to the media. Joe, you, last night you said you wanted Roger to go six, and you guys come away with the win, so it was all in all a good day for you. It was a great day. I mean, you know, we were able to score some runs. Uh, you know, he gave back the lead. In fact, he was coming in the dugout saying, my fault, guys, my fault, guys. And I was just happy he was able to win. I mean, he's not as sharp as he's going to be, uh, but... You know, overall, it was a good win, a uh, good win, and a good day for him. Bruce, show, do you think Roger got better as the game went on? Well, last inning, it didn't look like he tried to, you know, muscle up or throw hard. I mean, just tried to make pitches the last inning, and he had an easy time. Was it, was it enjoyable for you to watch? I mean, with all the emotion going on and him going to the mound and the way he ended. Well, it was enjoyable, but you, you know, you, you sort of became a fan. You wanted it to be good, and you know, it, you sort of take yourself out of the manager spot and. You know you're going to commit to him for, you know, 100 pitches, five innings, whatever the heck it's going to be, or six innings, and you're just going to watch it because uh, you know you trust him. You know he knows what he's doing, and I was just glad we had the positive result. But, again, it, it's exciting any time, I mean, he gets out and takes the mound because every time he does it, it's, you know, something added to his resume. Joe, uh, considering he finished with two strikeouts, was there any thought at all to let him go back out for the seventh? I didn't hear that last. What? Considering he struck out the last two in the sixth. No, no. Um, you know, that was enough for, for the day. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was surprised he, you know, was anxious to go out for the sixth. But that was fine with us. But that, that was going to be it, I think, pitch count-wise. That was enough. Mike, uh, Joe, did you add any extra bargains for that sixth round? No. No, I just told Gator to go on in and see what he wants to do. Uh, you know, certainly I wasn't anxious to take him out. But, you know, if he had been... You know, his tank was on empty. We were going to go get him. But we had, you know, somebody thrown right from the get-go, just in case he got in trouble. Well, not necessarily one guy, but just, you know, if it looked like he was laboring, we probably would have. George King over here in the back. Joe, do you know when he'll pitch again? Uh, with the off day, um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know because Gator, you know, will schedule. You know, there's a chance, you know, we'll pay it. We'll, uh, you know, we'll skip the youngster and we'll figure five days from now would be a guess. But uh, we haven't really, uh, you know, committed to that yet. Joe, to your right over here. Joe, you talked about you wanted a lift from this, the way the fans reacted and stuff. Did you guys get a lift from this as well? Yeah, I, you know, again, you know, we're playing well right now and, and we, we feel pretty good about ourselves. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, with Roger going out there, we sort of felt you know, that we were going to try to do anything we, we could to help him, you know, and support was really the only thing you're going to do with Roger out there because you know he's he's going to go out there and give you what he has, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, but uh, the, the players were, were really upbeat today. And I think, you know, part of it obviously was Roger, but the rest of it was, you know, how we're feeling about ourselves right now. Joe, what, what uh, about his sharpness? I mean, how, how good was it? What, what needs to get better? Well, just command. You know, command, he, you know, he, he uh, was missing his spots. It uh, looked like he was working real hard to, to, to try to do it. You know, my barometer really was Andy, you know, because I used Andy to tell me, you know, in comparison to what he's been, you know, the last couple of years. And, you know, that was just his feeling that he just wasn't sharp today. Velocity was fine, yeah. Now, again, he's not going to reach back and throw that 95, 96 stuff. You know, every once in a while, he'll. I'm sure he's going to get. He's going to throw faster or harder than he did today. After you know, he gets into a groove. But again, right now, he's he's a pitcher of you know fastball, split, breaking ball, and and that's what you're going to see. All right, we're going to take a break here on the Nissan Post Game. When we come back, we'll talk a lot more and get more reaction on today's ball game as the team's fortunes rise. So does the batting average of Bobby Abreu. Don't go away.